Let's do it. Alrighty. Are we live? Hopefully the audio works. It might just be a little delay. Oh, yeah. oh, there we are. There's okay. a delay. Cool. Well, it's Andy here. I'm Daniel for CNC and, Labs, yeah. And we're here to share, do the live stream for the uh, alt mill and talk about alt mill things. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, I guess yeah. we have a long list of questions and some topics to talk about. So. Yeah. So I guess I'll kind of explain the format for today. Um, first, we'll talk about everything that we want to share about the alt mill, uh, stuff like how the alt mill project got started, some of the engineering that we've done, some of the things that we've learned, some of the things you should expect with this project going on into the future. And we have something like 40 questions that Molly's put together for us from the community. And once we go through those questions, we'll answer any other questions that are on the live stream. So uh, yeah, we, have a, we can see the stream and all your comments on the screen over there. And we have our lovely gentleman running the show from the back. Uh, so yeah, I guess we'll start from there. So yeah, um, for the questions at the end, just save them until we get to the end, and then we can start reading them off the comments list. But uh, yeah, I guess we'll get started. Greg says more excitement. Huh? So. Oh, yes. More excitement. <laughs> yeah, more excitement. Anyways. I mean, well, so we launched the alt mill like about an hour ago. Yeah. And it was kind of surreal, at least for me, because I'm usually the one that does the back end of the website and like make sure the uh, questions get answered, especially for the rest of the, like for everyone on the team, for the customer service team and the people on the phones and all that sort of stuff. But uh, you, yeah, so usually I sit by the phone to make sure if something goes wrong, I'll, know, I'll be the first one to know. And I sat down at noon when, the, when, when it launched and got no phone calls for like 40 minutes. And then I, was, I said to Michael, either uh, the phones aren't working or we did such a good job setting up for the launch that nobody has any questions. So I asked them to uh, check if the phones were working. I guess we'll find out if we see any comments, anyone trying to call in. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, phones are down. But yeah, I guess um, to start, uh, we do have a blog post that's called Everything You Need to Know About the Alt Mill, which pretty much answers everything that I anticipated about Alt Mill on that blog post. And most of it will be re reiterated on the live stream. Uh, but we also have, obviously, stuff here to share about the Alt Mill. So um, let's uh, have some fun. and chat, I guess. Talk about things. Yeah. Cool. So yeah, I guess I have my list of stuff to talk about. So yeah. Um, first name of the alt mill. First thing. Yeah. So I the name, we'll talk about this. Uh, so the alt mill project started in what? 2022? Actually 21. 21. 21. Yeah. yeah. So I guess like a deep dive of the history of the alt mill. Um, there was a, okay, well, where do I even start? So the reason, one of the reasons we started this project is because me and Chris did a project where we made orthotic insole manufacturing machines as like a side contract. And we used a lot of the hardware that we, that kind of tie into the uh, alt mill. Um, and with that, we saw that it was viable to make a machine using this hardware. And so we kind of had it in the back of our minds to start building a machine around that. Um, but obviously with the long mill and all the changes and all the engineering and all of that stuff that we needed to do, it was sort of a back burner project. And um, eventually we started, well, I started kind of dabbling with a larger machine. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if you look back at the old blog post where we announced like the development start of the alt mill, it kind of goes over um, the initial designs of it. 
in terms of the name of the alt mill, it kind of is two different parts. There's the alt part and the mill part. Um, the alt represents uh, something to be alter like an alternative. And the reason that word is important is because us as a company, we want to be adding more to the, I guess, the, the scope of the technology to kind of be another option for people who are looking for uh, industrial machines and machines to do production work. Um, the other part where we get the alt part is um, alt, to alter means some, to, to, to change. And the alt, uh, the alt mill itself is a machine designed to change a material into something else. And then obviously the mill part is because it mills things. So that's sort of the way we came up with the name. Uh, so yeah, maybe you could, uh, so yeah, so that's the name of the machine. Maybe Daniel, you can go through what the purpose oh, yeah. of the machine Yeah, so was. I guess like me and Andy have talked about the purpose of the machine and like sort of its like reason of existing. And it's kind of just like a good way of putting it is what would happen if we weren't really kind of held back by some of the constraints on the long mill. The long mill is generally uh, designed to be very effective and affordable for someone in the entry level CNC space. Um, it's a very capable machine, but it's designed around being very affordable, and it is. Um, so it's very good for getting people into the hobby and you know, very productive for most projects. But I guess the alt mill is kind of a, a result of the approach of what would happen if we weren't to uh, kind of, not skimpy, but if we were a little bit more spend happy and we put in some more expensive components and kind of leaned more on the performance side. And uh, yeah, this is kind of just the culmination of that. So, yeah. yeah. So a lot of the, to add to what you said, um, a lot of the decisions we've made about designing the alt mill, it's been around considering how do we get the most machine for the least amount of money? How do we optimize things about this machine with the things that we know and with the technology that have come out and the things that have, um, like a lot of the parts on this machine and in hobby sensing in general have come down in cost and have improved over time. So it was an exercise in figuring out how do we get all of those together to make a machine that is as good as possible. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, it's like nothing held back, basically. It's yeah. just like, let's make the best you can get. Mm -hmm. um, and let's try and make it affordable, which I think it pretty much is. Yeah. So, And I think we'll go through like some of the competitive analysis. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where, because obviously, you know, when you like, think of like the best machine, mm -hmm. you're like, needs to be like super, super fast. Yeah. And then super big, super heavy, yeah. all of those things. Um, there are, yeah, like, yeah. There are better machines than this, by all means. but. It's about staying in a reasonable um, amount of money. Um, yeah. You know, like you're not going to be able to go out and buy a twenty thousand dollar thing. And even if you are, you're not going to have the freight, um, the loading dock to load in a three thousand pound steel frame into your garage. And you're not going to have the space. So it's kind of working within a reasonable budget, reasonable space, making this be able to be shipped in three boxes and set up easily in one day. Um, working in those constraints for the average drill that we want to make the best possible machine. And I think it's kind of turned out like that. So, yeah. so I think the way that I tend to put it is an intersection between cost, value, and performance. Somewhere where like all of those things converge to give you the most optimal machine you can get. So yeah. Yeah, um, yeah so let's talk about some of the engineering things that we've done. Um, I guess extrusion. Extrusion, I think extrusion is one of the biggest things that we've learned over the years, especially with the design of the long mill. Mm -hmm. um, when we went from version one, which was the regular angle aluminum extrusions, we chose to use that material because you can go to the store and buy it. And when we first started the company, we were building like a couple dozen machines per month and we didn't have the money, the experience, and the resources to develop our own extrusions. So the kind of our starting point was how do we 
make a machine that's really has a lot of performance but uses off-the-shelf materials so we can start at the small scale. Obviously over the years we've um, gathered enough resources to start uh, designing and making our own extrusions. Um, it, the, like, we, like, with the, the cost of the dye, the cost of the process, the, the quantities that we have to work with to be able to make the extrusions, now we're at that stage where the long mill, it makes that viable. And then now with the alt mill project, uh, we also learned the details of, you know, how do we make the extrusion, the dye so that it makes the extrusion straight. How do we know the tolerances that we can work within and do processes onto that extrusion to make sure it's straight and so on and so forth. So yeah. um, I can open up the dock sure. that goes through the uh, extrusion design and you can elaborate. So yeah, I'll just try and re recall things. Let's see, let's see. Uh, yeah. Do you want to share the screen? Are we sharing? Okay. Yeah, uh, I guess we can start with the, talking about, I guess, what the most important extrusions to worry about are. Um, actually, sorry, before that, we should probably talk, like, there's the extrusion aspect of can it meet our tolerances? Is it manufacturable? Uh, you know, is the die going to be a million dollars to make? Um, are these going to weigh a lot? It's like there's the feasibility aspect of everything, which is like kind of one thing, and that's a lot more of our own experience, just like trial and error. Um, obviously, the long mill is all custom extrusion, and we've been working that for two years or something, I think, now. Um, so we're very familiar with what we can expect, like Andy said. But there's the other side, which is the performance and optimization. So I think we published some other stuff on the long mill with regards to that talking about kind of the analysis we went into with uh, optimizing the long mill Mark II extrusion rails for rigidity and like kind of rigidity per unit weight. Um, so that also applies here for the alt mill. Uh, the frame, so the y-axis extrusions and the uh, x-axis or the table frame cross beam extrusions are a little bit less uh, important in that aspect, but the big extrusion you need to worry about is the x-axis rail. Um, for any kind of gantry style CNC router like this, it's always gonna be the bottleneck. This big x-axis rail is always gonna be the weak point. It's just a long spanning beam. So that's kind of where we had to stop and uh, really make sure this was well thought out and optimized in that regard. Um, so yeah, I guess you can probably see in this document, just kind of going through like the early-ish ideation things like that for uh, kind of looking into different extrusion designs and uh, sizing this appropriately for uh, kind of what we're looking for here. Um, you can see this is just a simulation, but um, anyways, long-winded way, long way of saying um, we definitely had to do our homework on what our extrusion was gonna look like and what thickness the extrusion was gonna be, just trying to make sure it isn't gonna be um, ridiculously heavy and needlessly stiff, but also very adequately stiff for the kind of uh, rigidity we expect to see. Um, something we talked about in the last video is uh, moving to linear guides and linear bearings, uh, ball screws and stuff, is like you kind of have to balance out the rest of the machine now. So you can't really uh, afford to use skimpier extrusions. You need to make sure those aren't the bottleneck now and it's kind of well balanced. You want half your deflection for your bit to come from the linear guides and have to come from the extrusion, not really one more than the other, otherwise you're kind of wasting things. But yeah, it's a pretty long and exhausting process, but it's worked out really well. Uh, I think our second alt mill video, we talked about, about the rigidity, so I, really, I won't bore you to death on that, but yeah, it's a pretty good outcome, so cool. Yeah, so I, get, I think to add to that, there's a lot of stuff that we've done with the machine and to the extrusion specifically uh, in terms of consideration for the practical application as well as the working within the tolerance of the machine. So like, for example, we machined the surfaces for the linear guides. Um, so I guess to explain, um, 
One of the challenges with working with uh, linear guides is that they have a stricter tolerance in terms of how li lined up they need to be to make sure they don't bind and they, uh, how do I say? Oh, there's adequate alignment. Yeah, like adequate alignment yeah. and- They need planar as the word, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, and yeah, so those things are, like with the, 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 the long mill, uh, because of the V-wheels and a little bit of compliance and, uh, thanks Greg, Greggy boy. <laughs> uh, yeah, because there's like a bit of compliance and we have some adjustability in the, in the whole system, uh, the V-wheels work and we do have like information and tolerances that we stick to and we have, I think we'll show in a future video how we do the um, uh, tolerancing and, and measurements on the rails. For the for the long mill, but for the alt mill, it's a little bit higher of a level, yeah. and they have to be in line with each other properly. So, um, yeah, machining it is one part, and as we start the assembly process in production, uh, we'll probably have a lot more steps to make sure that the linear guides work properly. Yeah, um, that and also the ball screws. It's a it's kind of a challenge in some cases. Uh, these, yeah, these more expensive components are great, but as a lot of you may know, it's, they're a lot more picky. Um, you can't really just go and kind of strap on these to some kind of plate and expect them to not bind or have no issues. So it kind of has to be thought out in that regard, but mm -hmm. no issues, so. Yeah, the other part that I think it's good to point out is um, we now have a lot of experience making the rails really close to the length that we want them to be. Mm. Um, one, because we have our own saw, so we, we have a lot of experience cutting them. And then with the long mill, we need to make sure the ends are perpendicular and flat. Square. Yeah, they yeah. need to be square. So we have a pretty good idea on what we can expect. As, and by using that property, um, because the rails for the y-axis, like. Well, in any rail, they can be a little bit bent. Mm. Um, the way that Daniel's designed these guys is they kind of self-align each other. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. I think you have a lip Yes. Yeah. to help align that as well. Yeah. So that's kind of one of the other things is you can deal with the fact that extrusions won't ever be perfect as long as you can accommodate for that in your design by allowing everything to kind of average out and balance itself out. So that's sort of, I guess, what Andy's talking about here on the table is just your y-axis rails will always kind of average out any error that there is in the cutting or extrusion process. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Um, another thing is that uh, all these extrusions are custom designed. And I think in your notes you shared, uh, like, for, like the, some of the um, standard extrusions are pretty mm. loosey-goosey. Yeah, that's actually a very funny thing I was, uh, discovered in my research is the we did a simulation of a few just custom or uh, standard extrusion profiles uh, namely the 8016 profile so that's 80 mil by 160 mil that's actually very close to what the size is of our x-axis rail so it's like very similar to this pretty big but um, yeah the funny thing though is that the 8016 t-slot profile is like super weak for the amount of weight it is and it's simply just because of the number of T-slots in the extrusion. So a lot of these standard profiles are great, but as soon as you add T-slot and T-slot and T-slot on every single side, you have like, I think it's like 12 or something on the 8016. It's like you have so many different, um, it's basically a flexure. You have like so many different little weak points where the extrusion is going to bend and have stress concentrations and stuff like that. So we've tried to minimize that. You can see we've only got, well, top and bottom T-slot, T-slots. And uh, most of the extrusion is kind of blended somewhat as much as possible. You don't want any sharp corners in here. Um, just little things like that add up um, as far as rigidity goes. So yeah, being mindful of things like that and uh, comparing the two is like pretty important. So we're able to, I think, achieve a little bit more rigidity or similar to the 8016 extrusion, which is the same outer size but I think the weight is like a quarter or something insane. It's like super, super improved over the um, 80-16 like weight to strength ratio. So 
It's like little stuff like that you can really improve on with a custom extrusion. It's not just about like how big is this extrusion. It's like, it's it's a whole rabbit hole. But anyways, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think the walls are different thickness depending on the, how we want to optimize yeah. strength in different areas too. Yeah. That's the same with the uh, the long mill rail as well. So I think if you look up the blog, it's insane. Can, yeah. We have like pages of yeah. documentation on how to make the extrusion as rigid as possible. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know. I know. Chris spent like weeks on this. Many sleepless he, nights. Uh, this sure. is like when he was doing his uh, fourth year. No. Um, okay, so we started the company when we were in, in university. So I remember Chris project, uh, the write up, uh, what like he had to do a write up on the uh, of an engineering project in the job. So he said that, you know, running this company was his job, which mm. I, I mean, it is. But um, yeah, his his uh, report was on how to make the, uh, the, the rails as rigid as possible. And I think he got like the highest mark possible. Nice. Yeah, so uh, there's a professor out there that thinks our engineering is good too. Hopefully he's watching this. Yeah, maybe, Anyways. who knows. <laughs> um, yeah, I think another thing to share is um, the cross beams, the way that we're mounting the, the uh, what do you call it, the MDF. Cable mounting, so. Yeah, so um, what, was the, what was the size that we were using for the cross beams originally, like the stuff we bought from McMaster? Oh, yeah, we were doing some prototyping with a 3060 extrusion, so 30 mil by 60 mil rectangular profile. Um, yeah. Yeah, so this this is more rigid than that. It's too. much more rigid. Yeah. It's, it's crazy. Um, it's, again, like a smaller-ish total footprint. It's much lighter. But yeah, just optimizing it for strength in the right directions is like very, very beneficial. Mm -hmm. Like, again, iterating again, custom extrusion is like, it opens up a whole new door in terms of like optimizing for how you're actually using it. Like I love standard extrusion for making jigs and little projects and stuff, but it is totally different when you move to this stuff. Uh, um, anyway. uh, yeah, so I remember when we were working on this part of the machine, um, we were looking at how other companies were mounting the MDF, like the wasteboard essentially. And so, uh, that was like, I, I, I'm kind of a, a fast and loose kind of person. So um, I, most of the designs that I think I saw where you would have to drill the holes to line up with the T-slot, put the mm -hmm. T-slot and bolt it in, which, um, yeah, if you think about it, you got to like slide the thing in and yeah. like make sure it lines up and obviously you have a whole sheet on top of the machine. That's not easy. It's like one of those things that sounds fine. Yeah. And you're like staring at the CAD model and you're like, it's easy, just slide the thing. But then you go and do it and you're like, how do I slide the thing to where it needs to be if I can't see it because it's covered by MDF? Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And also if you miss where the hole is supposed to go, yeah. then you're putting a hole in the extrusion and now you kind of mess that up and mm. it's a whole thing. Um, there's other designs where they kind of integrate the extrusion, the cross beams so that there's a bit of a lip and then you put slats of MDF. You got to cut the, yeah. the MDF into slats and then you fit the slats in, which is, in itself is a whole thing. And you still need to drill a hole for your mounting as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which, yeah. So it's a whole other thing, which, um, uh, I also like, if you have to cut slats, um, of like three quarter inch MDF sheets, it's a little bit unwieldy. I think it's like, it's one of those things that's fine if you get them with the machine, um, which a lot of people do and that's great. But I think the issue is like, okay, two months goes by, you've made your wasteboard look like we've done to ours and it's like time to freshen it up. And you're like, oh no, now I need to cut these exact things. Um, and oftentimes they'll be larger than your machine can cut because it's the wasteboard. And uh, you're like, what do I do? It's just kind of annoying to be honest. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So because we love you guys, uh, we try to make it as li less, <laughs> like little annoying, what's the word? Least. As least annoying as possible. So with this design, um, there's actually just a lip. So you, this is where the extrusion goes. And then you just bolt everything from the bottom of the table. So you just put the whole wasteboard mm -hmm. on top and there's holes drilled out. So you can put a screw from the bottom. And there's also a T-slot on top. Yeah. If you wanted to do that. Yeah. If you want. Yeah. yeah. If you, yeah. So if you, you got like all yeah. the options. You could also tap those holes and screw down. Like 
we've basically tried to give you every single option. Instead of trying to decide, like, this is the best option, it's just like, OK, we'll just let you do all of the options. Um, and you know, the easy, low-hanging fruit is just from underneath, which mm -hmm. that's what we did on ours. It's super simple, super easy. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a, that's a cool thing. Yeah. Um, yeah, and obviously we use the T-slot on the leg part of the machine, and it also helps assemble some of the other bits and bobs. Yeah. So yeah, overall, it kind of all works together. Uh, yeah. Cool. I think another thing we can probably show is um, how bi the size difference between the oh, two, yeah. two rails. Yeah. So yeah, this is the aforementioned Long Mill Mark II X-axis rail. Um, it's pretty small compared to this guy. Uh, it's also a much thinner wall thickness as well. So yeah, like you can see the kind of weird organic almost looking shape of this. It's like very heavily optimized for the long mill. Um, yeah, but it's just, I, I guess there isn't much to say about it. It's just bigger. Yeah, bigger is better, <laughs> yeah. I guess. Yeah, so. I mean, the long mill <laughs> rail has a good personality. It, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I don't yeah. know if you have anything else to say. Um, no, not particularly. I mean, we did like learn a little bit, I guess, um, in terms of like the. We, so we already started the first batch. They're on the way now. I think they'll be here in like one and a half weeks. Uh, but we also need to make sure the ball screw and the surface of the Z -ax, uh, X axis plate line up like very, very close. So the future version might have that machine too, um, because they they we we check the the, the sizing the the tolerance of it, and as long as they get extruded properly, it's fine. Mm. But you know, in hindsight, if we just machine them, it'll be even closer. So yeah. that might happen. It's not really necessary, but it's it's an option, I guess. We'll see. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess like the related to that, it's like any of the future changes we probably will see in any of these extrusions or the machining of them is usually just going to be some kind of QA thing. It's more about like saving us a bit of work and headache than uh, improving. Like as far as we're aware, like there's nothing really we would change performance wise. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you have anything, but. Yeah, I think um, like we can go deep dive, more deep dive into the, the breakdown of the rigidity. Yeah. Yeah. And like what the, I guess the, what is the word? The weak Practical points. differences yeah. you see once yeah. we consider all these things. So yeah. um, I, I mean, guess. that could that can be our next topic. As it stands though, I'd say like, it's probably pretty low priority because it's like the machine is already performing, like the rigidity is way more than we frankly need. Um, so it's like, it's almost like such a low priority. It's like, you're maybe gonna benefit like one person who's like obsessed with milling steel nonstop day in day out, maybe, but yeah, we'll, well see. It's yeah. yeah. Well, you have some numbers you can share. Yeah, like yeah. In terms of deflection, if you want to. Yeah, we can talk about that. that. I think these maybe are back in this guy somewhere, mm -hmm. somewhere. So Where's I think I think based on what the numbers that uh, Daniel had, it was like an eight times difference, right? like eight times it, between the long mill yeah. and the, the alt mill, right? Yeah. Oh, this is, yeah, this is just uh, old stuff. Never mind. This is about the extrusion, not about the actual right. deflection. So yeah, like Should measuring. This, you want to share the screen for, oh. to show this? Uh, yeah, it's already like, I just have to get. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, we're good, we're good. Okay. Yeah, so we have a graph. Yeah, so you can see this is our rigidity coefficient. It's just essentially how much deflection um, per amount of force. This is the graph on the right I'm talking about also. Um, anyways, you can see where our Mark II x-axis extrusion stands, so this guy. And then you can see where our um, old mill profile stands at some various uh, thicknesses, wall thicknesses. But yeah, you can kind of get the gist. It's uh, much more beefy. You can also see the 8016 extrusion profile we were just talking about before. So we were benchmarking this for a little while before against that. and. Uh, yeah, you can see in some cases it's like double the rigidity, despite this extrusion weighing like so much Four more. Times more. <laughs> yeah, so much more. Um, anyways, yeah. Uh, but as far as the experimental kind.
kind of uh, testing we've done, it, yeah, like Andy said, it's about eight times as rigid as the long wheel Mark II. Um, that doesn't sound like much, but there's some things to consider with that, which are, we're comparing this against like a freshly tuned, like optimal long mill Mark II. Um, not to say that it like degrades over time, but uh, you know, with maybe six months of wear and tear and you haven't adjusted your freewheels and you haven't adjusted any kind of backlash and stuff, it's like that probably becomes more like 20 times um, difference in rigidity. So yeah, and then the other thing is like eight times the rigidity of something like already quite competent in most materials is like quite absurd. Um, the long mill Mark II has cut a lot of aluminum, a lot of plastic, a lot of hardwood stuff, no issue. So it's like already taking something pretty adequate and then just bumping it up like ridiculous amount is pretty cool, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, cool. Okay, I'm gonna, you can go back to the normal screen. Alrighty, what else we got? Should we take, talk about electronics? Oh yeah, Motors, sure. VFD, yeah. SLB, all of this stuff. Yeah, so this is actually something we've gotten a lot of questions about already. <coughs> it's a, like, can I use the SLB with the alt mill? Are you guys gonna include an SLB with the alt mill? Stuff like that. Uh, so we got the su SLB, super long board, SLB for short. Um, if you haven't heard about this already, we are launching this slash we've sold um, all of our first batch of the super long board prototype, not prototype, new upcoming controller. Um, we actually just got in, I think our first, how many is it we got today? 475, I think. Yeah, yeah. so we got all of our production boards in just literally moments before we started like live stream. Like half an hour yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah. Um, anyways. So yeah, this is our new control board. Um, I won't go into the whole depths of it because you've, if you've heard of it, you've probably read about it. You've probably heard our other videos and we had a live stream about this as well. One of the notable features though is that it has new integrated drivers. These are the TMC 2660, I believe. Yeah, they are. Um, and these are integrated drivers meant for driving. Pretty sizable motor, like the NEMA 23 is used on a long mill. You could probably drive a little bit bigger of a motor even if you needed to. Um, but yeah, uh, kind of one of the main issues is that we really wanted to go to a either 36 volt or 48 volt system. Um, one of the things with voltage is just it basically allows you to run much higher speeds on a typical stepper motor. So obviously one of our kind of goals with the alt mill was not just rigidity, but faster speed. So faster rapid travels, things like that. And uh, basically meant we had to move up to higher voltage system like that. And these guys, I believe are rated at either 30 volts or 32 volts, I don't remember. Um, kind of just meant those were sort of out of the question. And the other thing we really wanted was to move to a closed loop stepper motor option on the alt mill. Um, you can see Andy's holding one here. Uh, so this is a sample of one. It's uh, just a regular NEMA 23, but it's got a little backpack on and it's essentially the driver's built in and it's got an encoder to check for feedback and kind of do all this control stuff. We can get into that a bit more there's later. A, there's, a new, there's the long mill yeah. for scale. Yeah, Yeah. quite a big difference. Um, anyways, uh, without getting too off track, basically this meant we weren't able to use the original super long board because this is meant for an integrated driver using an open loop motor. And we wanted to use an integrated driver on our motor and it was to be a closed loop motor. Um, anyhow, the solution for that is that we are going to be shipping with an SLB for the alt mill, obviously. Um, but it'll be a slightly different variation. So our internal name right now is like SLB EXD for external driver. And basically the only differences with that are that we are stripping the drivers off the board because we're not using them and it's kind of unnecessary cost. Uh, and then those are getting replaced just with uh, step and direction control going to our integrated motors. Uh, the other important thing, which is like a lot more of a nuisance than you might think it is, is we're running power through the board as well and we're doing all this uh, power circuitry as well to switch power on and off the motors. And uh, it's much more complicated than you might think. Um, you would maybe think you can just kind of flip a switch on and off and you can just like cut 48 volt power and turn it back on and it's fine. But there's a lot of like funky electronic stuff going on when you have a, it's called like a capacitive or inductive load and you're switching that. It's 
I'm, I'm going off topic. Anyhow, it's a lot of work, but we're uh, making very good headway on that, and uh, we're probably about to send some boards off for that very soon. Um, otherwise, it's a very unchanged SLB. You'll have all the same functionality as the uh, original SLB, and you'll get all our, any firmware hardware changes and updates that we might push out in the near future for that as well, and all the great resources we're currently making for that as well. And mm. um, yeah, that's about it. Yeah, so I, I have a, on my screen, I have the, uh, I guess like a mock-up of the version of the SLB that will have the external drivers. So yeah, just to add on to what Daniel was saying, I think the cost of the drivers adds up to like 30 or 40% yeah. of the actual bomb costs of the SLB. So taking that out actually reduces the cost of the board itself by a lot. So, yeah, I mean, yeah, might as well lower the cost if we can. Yeah. Um, yeah. Other stuff to add. It'll be the same size and form factor. Yeah. As the same uh, the long mill SLB, so it'll fit in the same case and everything. Um, and yeah, also to add to, we have another external board that will control the power to all the motors and... Oh, it's, it's integrated. Oh, it's integrated. integrated yeah. Okay. We you have just actually, had the prototype of... So this is a sample board. Um, you can see there's a giant relay. Um, this is dealing with switching that really big um, energized load on and off. Um, and then some other kind of safety features. So yeah, I guess related to that is like safety wise, when you press the e-stop, you really want your machine to stop. You can't leave that up to chance. If your CPU is, or MCU is kind of, I don't know, lagging or something, you press the e-stop and you lose your hand, like that's not something I'm gonna feel comfortable <laughs> with. So when you press the e-stop, we wanna make very sure that at all levels it's getting stopped. Um, I know there's some other manufacturers that will just stop the machine digitally. So just on the logic side, it'll tell the MCU like, please stop, but you know, it's good to have some redundancies in place when your machine is like a 60 pound gantry flying at your face. Uh, so yeah, we're kind of working on that. And this is just kind of one of our boards. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll also give a plug, I guess, to Expatria, their uh, electronics team that we're working with uh, on the super long board. And they're helping us again with this SLB EXD. Uh, we're actually using their original prototype board. This is called the Flexi Hell. So that's actually what we're running on this for some of our testing and stuff while we're waiting for a production version of the SLB EXT. Um, but it does a very similar thing. And like, if you're looking for a good low budget uh, board that's open source and is like pretty reliable, like definitely give this a look. But mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe this is like what most of the uh, print NC mm -hmm. community uses for, for their machines. Yeah. So uh, yeah. Um, it sounds like Andrew paid me to say that. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just a fan. I'm not, you can pay me. Yeah, I guess like, <laughs> like the good thing about our community is that um, we have, we're involved with a lot of open source projects. Um, and so the community kind of, well, in a way it kind of feels like we're bankrolling a lot of stuff. Cause like a lot of the development that, uh, you know, going into Gerbil Hell and these boards trickle, like they're all open sourced. And so anyone can copy them and use them for their own projects. And so obviously we built off a lot of the uh, work that Andrew has done, but there's also a lot of development that cycles back that we've done on the super long board that will show up in, yeah. in future iterations of different boards that s exist slash will exist. And obviously the firmware Gerbil Hal is shared with um, a lot of other machines um, or we will see probably. Probably in the future. So I guess like a little bit of backstory. So the long mill runs Gerbil, which is basically a firmware built on 8-bit platform on the Arduino. Pretty much every hobby CNC uses that. Yeah. Very few exceptions. Maybe like three or four of the big ones you might hear about. Mm -hmm. Everybody uses it. Um, because the processing power is pretty limited and like the Arduino does have IO for um, stuff like four or five axes which we need for the Vortex to work. Well, mm -hmm. not that we need it to work, but to if we want true. full four ax true four axis machining, which um, I'm sure people will ask and the alt mill will support mm -hmm. um, as the same way the, it does for the long mill, um, we move to the 32-bit architecture. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, the 32-bit is actually super important for the alt mill because when we were doing some testing, we noticed like 
at some speeds, if you're interpolating a circle or you're cutting a circular shape, uh, the machine will kind of get overwhelmed. So if you don't actually know, when you're cutting a circle out in a CNC, you're not actually cutting a circle. Um, you're cutting like a bunch of splines. It's like, imagine, what's a, what's a polygon that has like 20? Dick. Anyways, <laughs> yeah, something like that. It's basically imagine you're cutting an octagon. It's like you're doing a bunch of little splines. So if you're doing a big circle and you're doing it really fast and you have some amount of tolerance to that, you're probably cutting like, I don't know, 3,000 little lines at once very consecutively. So the faster you do that, the more computation your little 8-bit um, Gerbil, Arduino, or controller board has to process. Um, so we, yeah, we actually really needed 32-bit to be able to process fast enough to keep up with the crazy speeds on this machine. Um, so yeah. So I think there's the other thing that's exciting about um, using the same, I guess, platform for alt mill and the long board is that some of the features that are important for the alt mill can trickle down to the long mill and vice versa. Stuff that is already in progress with the long mill will be beat features available on the alt mill. I think one thing, uh, especially w because of our use with the closed loop steppers, is the ability, like, because, so I guess a bit of an explanation, but um, with the closed loop steppers, because there's an encoder that basically understands the position of the rotor as it spins and moves the machine, if that stops for any reason, and in the long mill, we typically call it stalling or crashing skipping, yeah. um, or skipping. The, the motors will know. So if they can compensate and catch up to the stall, um, then it can continue cutting and nobody will know the difference. In the case where it stops and it, and it can't keep up, the, there will send an alarm signal. So mm -hmm. the, the controller will know and we can shut everything down. So if you do crash the machine or it gets overloaded, um, not like it'll send the signal, it'll be able to turn the spindle off for safety reasons. Yeah. It's actually a very big like safety plus having this. Yeah. Like we're doing some very sketchy stuff, like just plowing through aluminum and things, and it's like it's really nice when the machine knows that something's gone wrong. It'll just halt everything. You don't have to be there to press a button, mm -hmm. so you can stand far away and just watch it. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. Um, there will be the same kind of integration, not in the same way, but with the uh, stall problem. Like this is still stuff that we're in the works in developing, but a stall detection system for the long mill, which will also have the same feature. So if you lose steps on the long mill, it'll be able to shut things down as well. Uh, but in terms of like the process of how that happens and the safety uh, considerations that need to go into it, you know, all these developments are shared as mm -hmm. well. Um, Another thing I think is it, cool to share is the uh, squaring feature. Mm, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a good thing to talk about. That's a feature in Gerbil Hal. Um, so it is called dual y axis homing. Um, so you may have heard of this before, maybe not, but uh, Gerbil, the basic version of our controller and most controllers, uh, only allows for one sensor to be used when you're homing the y axis. Uh, like you see on most of these gantry style CNC routers though, we have a left and right Y axis. Um, so let's say you bump into your machine and you knock the right one, one mil or something. It's like now your machine isn't square. Um, you might never realize that until you go to cut out a rectangle and suddenly it's more of a parallelogram. Um, so anyways, with dual Y axis homing, it allows you to have two Y axis sensors. So one on the left, one on the right. And that means every time you home your machine, it'll home both and the machine will actually be able to automatically square itself uh, depending on what you've previously set up. Previously set up. Um, so yeah, like that's probably something we'll have uh, going on in the alt mill. And uh, yeah, mm -hmm. one of those cool features that we get to make use of in Gribble Hell. What else is there? Um, another thing that will be shared, uh, development will be shared between the two projects will be our S485 support. Mm. So for a little bit of uh, explanation on ORS-485, that's a communication protocol that a lot of spindles use. And I believe a lot of other industrial kind of, like it's a communication protocol for industrial use. Um, we'll touch on like the spindle part of the alt mill pretty soon, yeah. but 
uh, in terms of communication protocol, if one of, I guess one of the reasons, one of the benefits of using the spindle is that the machine control can change the speed of the spindle, turn it on and off, mm. and understand, like have a back and forth communication on knowing what the spindle speed is and, and be able to do things around that. So because the SLB has RS-485 RS integration, we're able to directly connect to the VFDs um, for the spindle. And this is also like mostly done, but still in the testing phase, which is to know what the spindle speed is and also be able to turn on and off the spindle and send what speed the, the spindle should be at. So if you guys have done any more, you, with a lot of the long wheel users, you might have done some cam uh, and uh, made some G code. And a lot of times they'll say what spindle speed you wanna be running at. If you, you can set what spindle speed you wanna be running at through the software, rather than turning a dial on top of the, uh, the Makita router or whatever router you're using. So um, it do, does thing, make things a little more complicated because I think with the long mill, you kind of just set it and forget it. Mm. Um, and one of the things that make this more advanced, well, I guess the opportunity here is that you can set the spindle speed based on the tool that you're using. So in uh, Vector Geek VCAR, for example, when you go through the tool settings, you can choose the uh, the, the tool speeds as well as the spindle speeds that you're running at. So if you know that you need a certain chip load and a certain speed to run your end mills at, it'll give you the most optimized speeds and it'll automatically set them for you. There's a lot more legwork to this, obviously. And um, yeah, there's a lot more legwork to be done, but this is more focused towards uh, advanced users. So I think it's a, a feature that more people will use. And obviously, if you don't want to use that part of it, then you can also change the speed manually. And yeah. you can see the speed show up on, on the VFD itself. The so, other nice bonus thing I'll mention is, I don't think we have this planned in our firmware immediately, but it's something we probably roll out later, is there's a spindle at speed um, notification. So it's essentially, if you've tried to dump a spindle and you're using this using like a PWM control or just like manually setting it, you kind of have to wait for the spindle to speed up to get to full speed before you want to start your job. If you do that a little too soon, it's like your spindle's hardly getting warmed up and ready to go, and you crash your tool in and it's not spinning fast enough. So there's a spindle at speed um, function with this RS-485 control where the spindle will basically start spinning up and wait till it reaches its full set speed before it tells the controller, hey, like I'm full speed, like let's go and the controller will wait for that. So you can press start job, and your job won't actually start until the controller, until the spindle and VFD have told it, hey, like, let's go, like, we're full speed now. So, yeah. So, yeah. Um, so that's some of the SLB-related stuff. Let's see what else we got to talk about. Um, We can talk about the legs. Should we talk about the legs? Yeah. Yeah. Wait, why are you looking at the table? No, uh, well, I, w I was just seeing, no, I was just oh, okay. seeing if there was like a thing on the table to remind me of oh. like, the other things we need to talk about. I thought about. there was like a leg on the table. <laughs> yeah, the legs. The legs. So yeah, like, I guess this is, um, it's, it's not something that was really required for this sort of machine, but it's kind of a natural fit. Um, both because the machine's very large, like 4x4 four four is no longer, like it can be a desktop machine, you can put it on a desk, it's just the desk has to be really big. Um, but yeah, it's kind of a bit more natural when you get to the size in this type of machine that you want like more robust legs to kind of be integrated and designed around the machine instead of just let's make this machine and then we can put legs on it after. Um, so yeah, it. The other thing I think a lot of people who have gone through the whole desktop CNC thing will realize is that you build your machine and then you have to build like a giant table and it's like, okay, it'll be like a super cheap trip to Home Depot and I'll come back and the workbench is like all done and it's like easy breezy. It's like famous last words, cheap, cheap trip to Home Depot, it never <laughs> happens. 
you don't come back there um, without spending like $200. So yeah, that's been kind of a lot of our experiences as well. And it's like, hey, like we could probably just make this integrated table like kit and uh, kind of probably just make it much better for you guys, give you lower shelf options and stuff like that. And uh, just make it a lot more rigid as well for this type of machine. And you'll probably still come out ahead versus going to Home Depot. Um, yeah. And if you want to talk about the like integration or yeah, okay. Stuff. So um, well, I have lots to talk about about the, uh, the legs. So okay. one of the things, one of the how do I say it? how do I start this? Um, one of the reasons why we don't have a four foot by four foot long mill. And there's lots mm. of reasons, but one of them is the fact that you, we, there's, it's not easy to get a material big enough to fit the footprint of a, a long mill that would be four foot by four foot. That's also true. Yeah. 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 So, so we could technically design this to be the size. You, just, you, you wouldn't have a surface to kind of put it on. And it was necessary to make some sort of structure to hold up the wasteboard. Um, that's why we have the bottom and the cross beams and the y-axis uh, rails kind of mushed together into the whole bottom structure. And um, it was just necessary to do all that extra work. Um, in, terms of the ta in terms of the table itself, so we, given the opportunity that we had all, this pla all these places to mount the table legs to, you know, we had the cross beams with the T, T slots and everything. Uh, and all, also we have that project over there where we were. Oh yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. the plasma cutter long mill. Yeah, top secret yeah. inside project. It hasn't been used for. No. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, uh, so we, it, Daniel did a project with the uh, long mill where we added a plasma cutter to it and then we made the legs uh, sh out of sheet metal uh, and that kind of got us with the experience to m work with the sheet metal to make legs like this and you know what we found out was oh this table is pretty sturdy yeah like surprisingly yeah, yeah that's actually it's a good point is like 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 I said this 60 pound gantry assembly is flying back and forth <laughs> towards you it's like you really need all the rigidity you can get you don't want to have your floppy two by four table kind of like flailing around in the wind yeah um, yeah like we ran this like full tilt doing some crazy accelerations and it's like it's able to shake itself around on the floor not like the not like the table legs are flopping but like it's it's like it's walking on its own just because of how fast i can share a video on you, here yeah you might almost need to like bolt it down if you're doing this all the time i mean yeah. why would you be like this is a maxing out Wait, I have a, there's like a slow-mo version. Oh, yeah. Let me pull it up. Yeah, so we were, we were filming this and I was like, oh, I'll just like make it vibrate for fun. Um, and it was like, I couldn't actually tell if it was still moving. So I had to film it slow motion to make sure it actually was. But You wanna share the screen, Louis? All right, yeah. there it is. So here it is just like going crazy. And it's like, yeah. Pretty wild, pretty wild. Um, let me skip to the part where it's like hardly moving. Oh yeah, here it is. So it's like without slow-mo, I genuinely was, you can see actually the, the um, shutter. Like I filmed this originally without any slow motion and it was going faster than the frame rate of my camera. <laughs> so I literally looked like it was like staying still. Um, anyhow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the machine really moves a lot and you need some very rigid legs to kind of accommodate that. But. Yeah. Um, so I guess the, to continue the story, um, there is like something that we learned about human nature, I guess, from the long mill. Uh, so to tell the story, when we started selling the long mill, we offered all the different router mount sizes. So we had the 65 millimeter, uh, the 52, the 71, and the 80 millimeter. And we knew that most people were gonna get with 
the 65 millimeter because that's what the Makita router size is. But we also got a lot of people who would order the 80 millimeter. And you know, this, the reason would be because eventually they wanted to put a spindle on it. Maybe they had another router they wanted to use, so on and so forth. What, what people didn't really realize is how much work it is to actually set those things up. And the majority of people ended up having to buy the 65 millimeter router mount. And because of the, all the extra work that we had to do to help the people, it cost more to, um, it costs every, like, so the way, the way that I see it is if we can reduce the costs for everybody, then the machines will just be cheaper overall. And because we had to do all this customer service and education and resource development and so on and so forth to basically get people back on the track of buying the uh, 65 millimeter router mount, I just said, okay, we're not gonna let people change it. Everyone will get the 65 because I know almost everyone is gonna get it. And anyone who wants to get the 80 millimeter router mount will just pay the $35 to buy it. And everyone will be happier because it'll just be cheaper overall. So the moral of the story is, if most people are gonna get it, oh, sorry, what's the, if we know, if we can anticipate that most people will come back and try to get it anyways, we might as well force them into getting it because I know that for everybody who says, I don't need the legs, they're gonna come back and be like, oh, I should have got the legs. And it will cost overall more, mm. even though there's gonna be a small group of people who might not end up using the legs. Um, like the whole population will benefit because yeah. it's just a default option. And also there's other considerations like the packaging complexity and the design of the packaging overall. Mm. Um, and that's something else we can talk about, which is uh, one of the constraints of the size and weight of the machine is to get it to be able to ship using a, a courier, UPS, FedEx, Canada Post, whatever it may be. Yeah. So. I guess to touch on sort of the way that our business works is we want to make a lot of machines with fewer variations and use economy to scale to make the machines more affordable. And so, yeah, the more, yeah, basically what happened was we're just getting everyone to buy the legs with the machine. Yeah. But I think it's going to be beneficial for everybody because the legs are actually pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We also did the whole customer survey and you know, the results were overwhelmingly, we just want legs. It's yeah. like, I, I'm, yeah. yeah, no surprises to be honest. Like they're, it's pretty cool. So I guess to share some features of the legs, um, obviously we, it bolts straight onto the frame, which makes it really simple to uh, attach. The newer version, I believe, have mounting points for some of the hardware. Yeah, so the electronics and VFD and stuff like that. Uh, oh, I don't have a screenshot we can show, but... Well, we can open the... Yeah, we can open the shape. It's quite broken right now, I think, but you can get the idea. Yeah. So you'll have your VFD. Um, just do a front view. You want to show the screen there? Yeah, there it is. Yeah. It's kind of... Not yeah, so this might be a little... Make transparent. Make transparent. There you go. See? Yeah. So you'll be able to kind of get your little VFD readout, change anything, start, stop from the comfort of your front table leg. Uh, so super handy, <laughs> things like that. Um, just some nice quality of life features and little provisions for like wire routing, things like that, but mm -hmm. yeah, not too much. Um, yeah, and then uh, I guess the last thing is, well, actually two more things, but there's self-leveling, not self, but leveling feet. Um, yeah, we have one here. And they'll swivel, accommodate your weird garage if you're like setting this up on a mountainous terrain, it's fine as well. Um, and you can level to avoid any kind of wobble, keep everything from moving. Uh, and then yeah, the shelf, shelf stuff is nice. So there's uh, places we can kind of cut up your own two by fours, any kind of wood you have laying around and just set up like a lower shelf unit. And the legs are designed so that you can pass through a full 49 inch wide sheet. Um, 
and just kind of store your random 4 by 4 sheets that you're going to work with for processing later. Uh, there's also a second set of holes, so you can have an upper shelf as well. We don't have one installed here, but you can have your own little second shelf for tools, laptop, stuff like that. Just put all your junk there. Ours is usually full of garbage, but we, oh, I guess cleaned it up. Scott cleaned Scott. it up for us. <laughs> nice guy. Um, yeah, super handy to have. Mm -hmm. So, And uh, I should mention that uh, the width of the from leg to leg is more than 48 inches. Yeah, yeah, that's what I was saying. It's 49 inch sheet will fit through yeah. just fine. So you can store your stuff in yeah. the sheets, the blank sheets in there. So I think, um, I guess to kind of add to this discussion, um, I think one of the limiting factors uh, to how fast the machine can go is just the shake. Yeah. Yeah. Like you can only design, like short of shipping you guys, like Sandwich. granite posts for legs or something. Like, yeah, there's only so much you can do to avoid like crazy vibrations. Like obviously we're gonna tune the machine so it's acting very reasonably. But like we've discussed before, these are super powerful motors. Um, you can shake the machine to oblivion if you really want. Um, and it's going to vibrate. There's really no amount of leg we can design for you that we can feasibly ship. Uh, that'll prevent that, but yeah, they're pretty rigid for what we do. Yeah, but I would like to see someone sandbag it down because I feel like if yeah. you can sandbag it down, it would it would reduce a lot of the vibration. I think even just like having maybe a stack of four or five like MDF sheets. Mm -hmm. MDF is like the world's most dense object, so <laughs> just stack like four or five of them. Exactly. You'll probably add another two hundred pounds to your machine. So, what's what's going on, Scott? Oh, Scott's asking if we can attach it to the floor. Hypothetically, you could. Like, I guess in that case, you just don't install your leveling feet and just do like Screw shimming. straight into the... Yeah, like shim it and then go sh like bolt it right into the concrete. I mean, yeah, like you can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I guess one other thing to mention is that the table to floor height is 34 inches. Um, it'll be a little bit more obviously if you have a MDF, but it's basically just size so that you can reach across the machine without like kind of getting on your tippy toes. Um, and also so that you can have an out feed or in feed table when you're working with a full four by eight sheet. Um, that's something we've noticed when we were getting to do some more project with this, projects with this is that it's amazing just grabbing a full four by eight sheet, not having to cut it down. And you can just kind of feed it in, run your four by four project, feed it in again to an out feed table, run another four by four project. It's like Amazing. You don't have to deal with any table saws. You don't need to own a table saw. You don't need to do any of that. It's just slide it. Mm -hmm. So having that 34 inches to like a standard table saw slash out feed and feed table height is like great. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's like a little bit of consideration to make it shorter, the table shorter, because mm. it will make the whole like system more rigid. And um, there's yeah. also like how far can you reach to the back of the machine part. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, see. we'll see, but as it stands, literally, ha. <laughs> there's the legs. Yeah. Um, yeah, what else? What other cool things to share about the legs? Oh, yeah, that's pretty much. Not much, to be honest. They're just legs, mm -hmm. after all. Um, so we've been talking for an hour now, and I need to use the washroom. Okay. So can we take a break? Okay, cool. Um, I'll just play like a clip of something cool. Like, oh, we have the video. Yeah, we'll share a video. So I made this part. It's aluminum. It's a little handle for our vice. Here, I'll bring this right to the camera because it's so shiny. Ooh, look at that shine. So shiny. Okay, I'm going to run to the washroom, but you can play the video if you like. Okay, I'll find it. Yeah, oh, it's right here. Yeah. Um, anyways, yeah, this is machined from a two inch by one inch bar stock of aluminum. Oh my God. <laughs> Our lamp just fell. Okay. Any wheeze? It's a little unstable still, though. Anyways, I'm just gonna ignore that. I'm gonna leave that. the microphone here so you don't have to hear the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what Jonathan just said. Turn off the mic when you're going to the bathroom. Yeah, that's a close one. Uh, anyway, so this is kind of just like one we needed a handle for our vice, not this vice, but similar to this. You get the idea. 
Um, and then also just kind of seeing how far we could, yeah, it's the wrong vice, but you get the idea. You can crank it. It's called a speed vice. It's a classic machinist random project. Um, but yeah, we were just kind of curious to see what kind of surface finishes we could get. So you can see we've got a little 3D pocket thingamabob here, just some random pocketing, and then like the end edge quality is like super nice. Um, yeah, just a little flashy demo piece. Uh, and we'll find the video where we got that. I guess I can just play this again. Is that? That's good. Do we have audio? Oh. I mean, yeah, there's audio, but I mean, it's, you know, it's not that interesting. So you can see we're just doing some facing, getting that nice top shiny surface. I'll skip ahead because it's like a 12 minute video. Um, and then we're just gonna do some pocketing. Just cutting some pockets. Ooh, very good. Cutting some pockets. Skip ahead to the other fun part. What else is cool? Oh yeah, this is roughing out the aluminum. So you can see it's like the actual roughing for this part only took like two minutes. Um, the longest part by far was just doing this like 3D pocket here, just because you know it's fine detail. But yeah, that's something we've noticed this, with this machine is like now that we can cut so fast and just remove material so quickly, it's like you're just usually limited by setup time. So it's like optimizing your CAM programs and optimizing how you're going to set things up if you're doing production work is like far more important than the actual amount of time it takes to cut something. Um, but yeah, let's uh, skip ahead. Some more of the finishing. Wow, what a fancy looking thingy. Mm -hmm. Sure love such a good thingies. ASMR, aluminum cutting ASMR. Yeah. Anyways, and then you remove the back from this, blah, blah, blah. You can see it cutting, yada, yada. And finishing and stuff, blah, blah, blah. Ooh, what a fancy spinning <laughs> shot. <laughs> oh my God, look at that thing go. Anyways, that's enough uh, aluminum for now. We'll get back to the live stream. But yeah. Oh, there's Chris. Cool. Hello. Yeah. yeah. So what's next? What's next? Um, 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 do you want to say hello? Here. Hello. I'm Chris and I approve this message. Did you see the new SLBs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think he said they were. It was the whole batch, but it's actually the batch that was supposed to show up. There's like two batches. Oh. There's oh, one that's supposed to show up Monday and one today. Right. And the one that's supposed batch. to show up Monday still hasn't shown up, and the one today did show up. I don't oh. know why it works that way. So it's 240 or 70. I don't know. 260 something. Something around there. Right. Right. Yeah. Cool. Well, we're excited. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have anything to say about alt. I, I can come down here. I don't have anything to say about alt mill other than it's a great project. And I'm really glad that uh, all the super longboard stuff and all the things we learned from long mill and all the things that Daniel and Andy learned generated so much smartness to generate such an awesome machine. <laughs> And cool. that's and, and also and also shout out to Andrew and his team at Expatria because without you guys we wouldn't be able to make such an awesome board, I which think... will also have a lot of awesomeness to make this machine more awesome. We are mechanical engineers. We can only do so much mechanicking mm. at the end of the day. <laughs> so integrating the electronics, the smarts. Uh, shout, out, shout out to the G Sender team as well for all the stuff we've been working on for G Sender compatibility to Gerbil Hal and to Terrier for his work on Gerbil Hal. It's gonna all culminate into, I think, a really awesome uh, new machine for the market. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, that's the face of CNC Labs, Chris Thorogood. <laughs> hmm. 
See you guys. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> Wait, you're wearing the shirt with my face on it? Yeah, that's why, that's why I wore it today. Yeah. This is, that's me from, what, 10 years ago? Uh, yeah, Nine, something like eight, that. Yeah. Eight, eight or so years ago. Yeah, I look, uh, I've, aged a, I've aged a lot, right? No, he's like the same age still. True. He's immortal. Yeah. And you will be making CNC machines until the end of time. Anyways, let us know if you want these shirts. We can start a new side business on uh, making Andy shirts, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay, cool. All right, that was a fun break. Yeah. Thanks for uh, waiting for me. Mm. Um, okay, what else can we talk about? <clears throat> tramming, I guess. Oh, yes. Tramming is tramming. a big one. Tramming. Uh, so, like, tramming is something that we're well familiar with in Long Mill um, as far as kind of what people want, what they want to adjust, how often it needs to be adjusted, stuff like that. Um, for the long mill, it's generally, the machine is generally trammed adequately, um, both adjusting tram, which is, uh, how do I show this? Here's a router mount. This is tram, whoop, left and right. And this is called nod, which is like this, because you're nodding, get it? Um, anyways, we generally have had the stance that your tram will be pretty much adequate for a long mill Mark II out of the box, um, long mill as well. Um, and this is generally a more hobby CNC, so you aren't typically chasing like a super crazy like mirror finish on anything. You don't need any crazy amount of tram. You're using smallish tools. Um, it's pretty much fine. But yeah, for the old mill, it's a machine in this kind of class should have tram and knot adjustment. Um, I will say that in our research, I haven't yet found a machine under like maybe $10,000 that will allow for a native like nod adjustment. A lot of machines will allow you to adjust that tram we're talking about. And a lot of machines will just tell you like loosen the bolts and just pivot it, which is fine. Um, but no one will actually allow you to adjust nod at all. So it's kind of weird. I don't know why it is that way. It's like the entire industry has like told everyone that tram is the only important thing and that's kind of not true because they're literally the same adjustment, just in different directions. Uh, so yeah, you can see we've got plates here. These are our production plates. So this is our prototype machine with prototype parts. This is a big, shiny aluminum Y-axis gantry plate. Look like, how nice that looks. She's chunky. Like, it's a big plate. Like, this is a very big plate. Like, you can cook off that. Unironically, we should cook an egg on this later. Mm. Um, anyways. So the whole point here is that we do have an adjustment feature for your nod, and so that'll allow you to kind of slightly tweak your x-axis extrusion using an eccentric bushing, which I forgot at my desk. Um, and then that same kind of feature is used on the rider mount as well. So this is a new rider mount for an 80, mil 80 millimeter spindle, um, and you'll basically have a slot, eccentric nut, and, or eccentric bushing, and you'll be able to slightly kind of tweak your tweak your <laughs> Tram, tram, and then uh, tweak your nod adjustment as well. Um, so yeah, that's kind of an exciting feature to have. It's something that's like definitely should be in a machine like the alt mill. Um, yeah, like nobody likes to put little shims under the router mount. It's really annoying. Ask me how I know. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's about it. But I guess it's good to point out like make it clear one the degree of adjustability is we're talking about like thousands yeah less than a thousandth of an inch which yeah. is like fractions of a thickness of a thick sh like hair mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. which i think i don't i i guess what, I, what i'm trying to say i don't want to we don't want to scare anyone in thinking that they yeah. need to do all this crazy so super eye yeah yeah that's a good point you bring up which is that um, usually when you introduce an option to tram, you're implying that it will need to be trammed and you need to adjust this thing when you're assembling it. And like to someone that's just starting out in CNC, like that's super intimidating. And like what I'm talking about might not even make any sense. Like I might as well be speaking Spanish. Um, so anyways, if we uh, can include a default option for adjusting those things where you can just install it this way and it'll probably be fine like 99% of the time, but give you an option to adjust tram, then that's the best. So that's what we've done. Um, it's basically going to be a system of you can install these bushings, um, shoulder bolts, 
and that'll be your default position. It should automatically be aligned like for 99% of users. But if you're in that scenario where you just need to do that very fine adjustment like Andy's talking about, you'll basically be able to pull that out and opt in for uh, a centric bushing, which you can use instead. So mm -hmm. it's hopefully not something you ever need to do, but the option is there. Yeah. So in terms of like what people should expect in terms of how they're going to tram, um, there's going to be a bunch of tools you'll need, including like a surface plate or some sort of really, really flat sheet. Mm -hmm. um, I think glass gets used a lot. Yeah. Um, and then you need a tramming tool, which is basically dial indicators stuck out a ways away. So you spin it and then you see where the dial goes up and down and then you adjust it to B0 in terms of how much it goes off by. So, uh, yeah. yeah. I think I, sh I should also mention that um, these plates have like features where the rail can mm -hmm. sit on. So there's like a bit of adjust, like there the cutouts are made to have the adjustability, but they're also like sitting on the surfaces that are machined really re to really, really high tolerances. So as long as they get assembled with that in mind, mm -hmm. the fit will be, well, very, very good. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Yeah, so also like so chunky. Yeah. This is what, 15 millimeters? No, way bigger. 19? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's so ridiculous. It's, yeah, very overkill. Yeah, like these are other parts I guess we haven't really shown yet, um, mostly because we just received these. But uh, yeah, your little Z gantry plate, the new 80 millimeter router mount. Um, this is a lot beefier than the long mill 80 mil router mount used previously, because yeah, obviously we need it. Uh, any other cool parts here? Oh, the axis. this is a cool one. So x-axis. Yeah. That's the There's no official axis. name. Well, yeah. not yet. This is the z-axis carriage plate, I guess, is the internal name. Um, yeah, big shiny piece of aluminum. What a nice sound. Uh, yeah, anyways, so I guess we mentioned in our last video before, it was uh, there would be a couple changes to production model from this prototype. That is one of the main things is, well, not main things, but subtle things is that some of these gantry components are going to be black. So any of the raw aluminum plates you see here, this is all black. This is black. The left and right Y-axis gantry plates that we were just showing you, black. Um, kind of the same color scheme as a long mill, just kind of sticking to that. But yeah. Cool. Uh, let's talk about spindles. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, yeah, so one of the things that we come to know about using the alt mill is that the if you want to use a Makita, the Makita will not live long for this world. Well, like if you're doing light stuff, it's fine. Yeah, like, but I feel like if you get the like, yeah, I I I don't. Well, I I I think some of you guys have seen the the monk the, not the monkey king the dragon. Yeah, project. the this one behind giant me. Thing. Yeah, that, so we started that project at 14,000 millimeters per minute, but the bit w broke. Mm. So then I had to dial it down to 9,000, which is already very, very fast. Mm. And even then the spindle was like... Not keeping up. Sa save my soul. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, the Makita can keep up, mm -hmm. but I know that the, with the long mill, it's with like the bigger bits and stuff, it becomes the bottleneck. Yeah. Uh, so I think we kind of made the decision to support spindles first and foremost. Um, the alt mill can use a Makita and we, the mount that's used for the, um, uh, long mill. the long mill, there's mounting points for that as well. So if you do want to use a Makita, you, you can. Um, but obviously we've done all our testing with the spindles either yeah. uh, 2.2 or 1.5 kilowatt. So um, yeah, so I guess to share some of the things that we're working on now. So the alt mill has a spindle and dust shoe option. So it's sort of like a separate, so you can buy the alt mill as a machine itself and then you can add on the, the spindle and the dust shoe. And that's sort of like one integrated plug and play option for um, a 1.5 kilowatt with the 110 volt 
um, system. System, yeah. yeah. So that's what we're working on. Um, however, you can share more, but bigger yeah, spin, bigger spindle. Yeah. So I guess relating to that is yeah. I see a question here. Is there a 2.2 kilowatt spindle offered? Um, and that's a question we got a number of times. Basically, it's the whole line of spindle progression you can see is you start your Makita router, okay, that's too weak, go to 1.5 kilowatt router or a spindle, okay, the next step from that, from that is 2.2 kilowatts. That's like not a huge difference. Um, it's like not a very large difference, but after that, you'd probably step up into something crazy. Um, so you'd probably go to like a five kilowatt or six kilowatt spindle. And that's like totally different ball game. Our kind of philosophy on that is basically just um, the jump between 1.5 kilowatt and 2.2 kilowatt is not big enough to warrant basically excluding a lot of our customers that don't have 220 or 240 volt in their shop. Um, so for those of you not familiar, you can technically run a 2.2 kilowatt spindle on uh, 110 voltage but it's kind of cursed and like seriously forbidden because you're, <laughs> you're drawing more current than is really acceptable for most 110 volt out, outages, out, out, outlets. outlets. Um, so yeah, we kind of opted to not do that and to settle at 1.5 kilowatts. Again, it's like 1.5 kilowatts, you'll be doing some very serious cutting. Like you're blowing everybody else, all your friends with their CNC's, you're blowing them out of the water already. Like you're, you're fine. If you're really like going crazy and you really want like, you want to be a god amongst your neighbors with their CNCs, it's like, go to a five kilowatt system. Like there's no point, don't waste your time with a 2.2 kilowatt system. You're gonna max that out. It's like, we've already maxed out our uh, 2.2 kilowatt test system as well. It's like, it is the bottleneck on this machine. It, this machine can handle way more power. So if you're really power hungry, like go, yeah, go buy a five, six kilowatt, even 100 kilowatt, I'm, I can't stop you. Um, buy whatever spindle you want, but the marginal improvement of the 2.2 kilowatt for trading off compatibility with like so many people is just not worth it in our um, kind of experience. So yeah, so yeah. I think for context, like we have three phase 220, like all of the power. We have everything, yeah. Yeah, because we have a, basically an industrial shop in here with a, a mill, full mill and everything. We so, didn't used to though. Like we would have been one of those people without 220. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, we spent like a lot of money yeah. to put that in. So I, you know, most people won't have access to that. I think, well, I guess like we have some customers that are planning to use this for like an industrial application mm -hmm. and they will have access to this power. And I think that there is an opportunity for us to offer more powerful spindles. Um, but yeah, I mean, not immediately, but yeah. maybe someday. We yeah. need to grow bigger. Yeah. Um, courage. We have to be. Grow I guess. Bigger courage. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. So. Uh, uh, yeah. Um, but I guess, like, in terms of how things are playing out with the spindle stuff. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have read my article. So I've done a lot of testing way back for spindles on uh, long mills, and. It's sort of a different ball game because a lot of our long mill users are budget conscious, and um, you know, budget conscious is important because we're not able to buy German-made spindles for like two thousand dollars. So I've done a lot of testing on basically the Chinese Amazon spindle options, and one of the main problems is that the quality can kind of be all over the place. So for example, we had a project, we were using the 2.2 kilowatt spindle, 110 volts. And if you mess something up, um, the wiring would fry. And when I took it apart, the wiring inside was really, really thin. And uh, so, you know, that's a, a problem. The other part is that the VFDs are not programmed and there's very, very little documentation on setting it up. Yeah, you yeah. need like an entire degree in manuals to figure out the manual for most of them. Yeah, it's kind of. It's pretty crazy. Because there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of settings like how, the ramp up speed, um, the, the frequency of the VFD and, and all those things that make it more complicated. And RS-485 setup, if you do want to use that as well. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and as we're currently learning now, 
the different types of control, the like field oriented vectors yeah. and, and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. It's that's a whole other thing. Quite rebel. Uh -huh. I will say the other common thing you find on these cheaper spindles is that they don't have a ground connection. I, I don't know why. If someone can tell me why, it'd be great. But a lot of these uh, spindles will ship and they'll have a pin on the top for ground so you can kind of ground everything safety wise and they just don't connect them inside. It's like a fake ground pin. Um, anyways, that's something we aren't doing with our spindle, obviously, Yeah. but I've, it's alarming. I've gone in spindles where it literally says on the instruction manual, do not ground this pin mm. because it won't work. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's funny. It's crazy. It's funny. Um, so yeah, safety, safety is a big thing. Safety is definitely a big thing. And having the right programming is important because I have fried some number of spindles yeah. uh, with the wrong programming as well. Um, the other thing is the cable, using the right type of cable is important. Mm -hmm. One, because uh, it is carrying a lot of power and also they need to survive the movement inside the drag chain. Yeah. And the cables themselves are not cheap. There's also the shielding aspect of it. Uh, so there's a lot of nuance to the spindle side of things that we will obviously figure out and give people the thing that works out of the box. Um, so yeah. Another thing that we've kind of dove deeper into, especially with the router project that Johan's working on and some background is uh, basically what we're working on is a router that uses brushless DC motor instead of the uh, AC uh, brushed motor because it has basically twice as much efficiency and you get more power out of the same thing and it'll be kind of the successor to the Makita for the long mill. The bearing stack up is also like mm. very different on different spindles. So I saw Johan doing some testing on the bearings on one spindle sample that we got, and he could literally pull the whole like, what do you call it? Shaft. Yeah, the whole shaft up and down. Yeah, yeah. Which is insane. Like that would it's, never work, yeah. especially in this application. Um, the direction of the bearings, the the type of fit, the preload. Uh, the materials that the bearings are made from. Oil or grease. Yeah, oil, yeah. grease, the maintenance side, like those are all really important considerations uh, that we're taking into, con taking into. so, uh, you know, yeah. that's, a, that's some interesting things we learned. So. More than meets the eye, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. <coughs> um, I guess it's just the future can talk plans. about yeah, future plans. Mm -hmm. So yeah, future plans. There is a, oh, I'll quickly answer this question while we're on the spindle topic. Mention of liquid cooled spindle. Um, so this is an air cooled spindle that we're shipping with. Um, it's so much less work than setting up the entire water cooled system. Obviously the water cooled system is better, technically speaking, but you probably won't run into any issues with an air cooled spindle. So it's sort of just saving you a ton of headache. Um, that being said, we do have a space in our drag chain that we've allowed um, for water-cooled lines to plumb into if you need to. Um, relating to that and relating to the next topic we we're gonna talk about is there's probably room for some other stuff like airlines um, if you wanted to do misting or air blast, <coughs> as well as airlines for, I don't know, maybe a tool changer or something. Um, anyways. Don't get them too excited. <laughs> no. Uh, this isn't us like promising any kind of tool changer um, right away or anything like that. But you know that's obviously something that comes up a lot, a lot for this machine. It's like, like we mentioned before, your setup time is most of the time that's gonna. Oh my god, your setup time is gonna be the bulk of the time it takes up for you to finish a project, start to finish. Um, so tool changing is like an obvious next uh, way to address that by having it automatically change tools. Um, so yeah, we don't have any immediate plans for that. Uh, yeah, but it certainly is much easier to do that on this type of machine. It's bigger, it can accommodate those larger spindles that will have tool changing capabilities. And uh, the uh, control board with Gerbil Hal is also much better suited to tool changing. Um, you can do a lot more advanced tool changing things, uh, which yeah, hopefully we'll get into all of that at some point, but. Yeah. yeah. Chris and Chris and the G Sender slash SLB team have 
um, set up the integration to put the bit changer. And also we have uh, one of the ATC rapid change mm. thingy majiggies to do the testing on. Um, although I have like my opinions and qualms of the rapid change, like that does kind of set the direction on what like being able to do the tool changer stuff. Um, but yeah, the SLB has the inputs and outputs and all the integration and Gsender has the uh, coding potential to integrate all those things together. I believe there might be documentation on how to split the bit setter already or um, either there is documentation and it's not public yet or it will be eventually released. So you can put an aftermarket bit setter on. Um, I also know that a lot of the, uh, comp there, there are some companies that have different tool changer options. Either you buy like the industrial one or some hobbyist ones. I think P P PWN CNC mm. has their tool changer system. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot of other people. Yeah, they, they are pretty expensive. Yeah. And obviously you guys know we want to make stuff to make the things affordable because mm -hmm. I think the cost of tool changer is like almost a little more than half the cost of the all yeah. itself. Yeah, um, it's like one of those funny scenarios where you like buy a machine four thousand dollars and it's like, okay, I'm gonna buy this spindle now for another four thousand dollars. It's yeah. like when you buy like your 1998 Honda Civic and you're like, oh, I'm gonna go buy these five thousand dollar wheels. It'll be so cool. <laughs> I'm, I'm not hating on anyone, yeah. but it's just kind of funny. That's all. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know. It's it's in the works. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Well. Like not, it's not in the works. Not, I, a, not, a, not officially. Yeah. There's just like things happening that kind of yeah. lead up to I think we should, being able to. Yeah. Yeah. No, don't get too there is no like immediate plans for a tool changing spindle or system uh -huh. um, as of now. Yeah. But it's on our minds. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, bigger spindle. Yeah. I guess we can talk about like the min the smaller one, the smaller machine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Potential for that. Do you have the CAD for it on <laughs> Oh, <here>? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know where it it's is. It's in a different workspace. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think you should have access. Oh, yeah, you do. Okay. I guess I can share the back. It's <laughs> 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 multiple. <laughs> yeah, share the, you can share the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can see this is... <laughs> Uh, a shrunken down version of the alt mill, just for fun. Uh, I just had some time to kill, so I was like, oh, I can shrink it. Anyways, we've called this a smalt mill internally <laughs> so far. <laughs> it's got eight by eight inches of travel. Um, you know, it's this, the same height, <laughs> but uh, yeah, kind of just for fun. But also like, yeah, I guess the next logical topic is like, can we make a smaller alt mill? Um, yeah. So like, you know, you're probably meaning that in the sense of like, can you make a two by four, well, two foot by four foot alt mill. Um, yeah, I guess that's like, we can, but we're kind of doing this first, I guess. Yeah, so I guess I can kind of share the, I guess the vision in a way, or like the, the, the roadmap future. Plan. Yeah, the roadmap yeah. kind of. So. Uh, as I was talking, we were talking about the alt mill, it's sort of like the foray into working with higher level technology and working with some higher level components and so on and so forth. And in terms of like, especially what we learned from doing the long mill stuff is that building the long mill itself is easy, making them at scale, making them high quality, having the resources, customer service, everything is like a big, it, it, I would almost say that we are an integration company that happens to make CNC machines because, um, yeah, I think the development of the long mill probably it was like between me and Chris for the most part. And then, you know, after I think a year of development for the Mark II, it was ready to go. But obviously we spent like, you know, 20% of that time and 80% of, of, of doing other businessy things. I think the long mill is sort of, sorry, the alt mill is sort of where we, building the machine itself is easy, making it work for the manufacturing and the, the tolerances. It's like, the way that I would put it is, building a CNC machine is a science and, and an art in a way. 
Mm. Because, like, I think one good example is uh, with the Shapeogo 5 design that you showed me, mm. with the connecting of the Y. Oh yeah. Gan the Y gantries and the rail. Yeah. Um, so you guys can look it up if you want. Basically, the mounting, the way that you mount the rail of the X axis for the Shapeogo 5 Pro and the Y is. Be nice, Andy. <laughs> uh it's it's a it seems like a weak point basically yeah and and um when we design machines like this we have to find all the weak points and iron them out because it doesn't matter how rigid the machine is if you're i don't know the connection between the x and y there's always the weakest link yeah there's always a weakest thing. link yeah you know for the long mill it's the v wheels we have a yep. we have a diagram which is like where does all the deflection come from and mm -hmm. it's like Rail is really strong. Yeah. The, the, the mounting for the Y rail is like really, really strong. Yeah. Where does all the deflection come from? And we did the same type of analysis on the, in the long mill. Mm -hmm. And obviously when in this system, the spindle and the bits are a big uh, limiting factor. And also the heaviness of the table is also a limiting factor. But those are not uh, Achilles heels, yeah. I, would, I, would, I would say, because yeah. you can, we can make them better. I'd say it's on the budget. Yeah, this machine is kind of at this point in performance where it's less about rigidity and more about just making it super heavy. Um, you know, that's kind of the transition you see in like a lot of industrial CNCs where it's like, like someone like Haas isn't making uh, things more rigid. They're just like, let's just make this heavier and add more weight where we need to and do all the modal analysis and stuff. So this is in the kind of area where you want it to cut steel or titanium or something better, it's like, okay, you just have to do all this other stuff where you're adding weight and uh, optimizing other things. It's not entirely about rigidity, mm -hmm. but yeah. Anyways, to, to kind of end the ramble, um, yeah, so making the machine was sort of, is like kind of the, making just a machine is easy, making everything work together is really hard and now that we've kind of come to this point and we're really happy with how things turned out, it's like, where do we go from there? Um, making, a, making a bigger version of this is kind of yeah. make it longer. There is, there is other considerations like the power transmission system, you know, rack and pinion, mm. bigger ball screws, maybe, a, yeah, yeah, stuff like that. Um, or making it smaller is also kind of almost trivial in a way because parametric CAD yeah. <laughs> change size. Yeah, yeah. But to do each of those things, um, we need to build the production and the process all around it, which is like the hard part. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. um, there are like some opportunities I think this sort of brings. Um, the small machine is a good one because we've obviously proven it can cut aluminum. And once we make the machine more stout or small, yeah. As some people say. Yeah. It can cut even faster yes. slash it'll be more rigid because less long means more rigid, right? Yeah. Less arm, less torquey arm. Pretty much. Yeah. Um, I last year and this year I went to China and Brazil and obviously I've spent a lot of time in manufacturing facilities in Canada as well. And one really exciting like thing that kind of stood out is they use really big mills to make really small parts. Mm. And um, sometimes they're not really high tolerance parts. It's like, you know, milling polyurethanes and plastics, mm -hmm. aluminums are generally pretty on the soft side. So the idea is we can use the same technology, but what if we use it for industrial applications where we can replace, we can make small mill, replace a $100,000 VMC. Obviously, it won't do exact everything the VMC can do. It, you know, maybe not cut steels and titaniums at the same speed, but for you know fifty times the cost, um, you could put ten of them in the same room. And a lot of the production work that those machines do, um, you put the lower value stuff on that and the higher value stuff on the expensive one, and they kind of can work out. Um, so those are like just some ideas. Um, we have other engineers like uh, Michael and John who are more familiar with the metal cutting th stuff, I think. And, uh, Michael specifically has built his big mm. metal make milling machine. Um, 
so yeah, like we can do whatever. We can do anything. Yeah, yeah. Like we kind of built the platform around this. So and the electronics is very very advanced at this stage, um, and you know we play around with the bigger spindles and all those things. So yeah, yeah. The other thing I think is that um, well, it's the money part, which is now that we have another all of the development to make this machine was funded by the sales of the long mill. And when we, obviously we have to make a profit because we're a business, but there's more money in the alt mill that can be put towards developing hobby CNC in general. And so the pace of the development is gonna get a lot faster and a lot more dramatic um, with the inclusion of this within the company. And so I think that sort of plays out a bit of what we might expect in the future. Yeah. Cool. Um, is there any competitive analysis we want to talk about? Uh, I don't know. I can share Let's like see, yeah. the, the acceleration, the speed stuff. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So um, I think this kind of gets into the practical side of what Altmill does. Um, because one of the things that we're considering is, okay, this thing is freaking fast, but does it need to be that fast? The answer is kind of not, I feel like for most people, um, they won't see the full potential of the alt mill just because of how much potential there is. Um, and, but also the comparison between an actually industrial machine versus the alt mill, um, it, like what, where, what difference is really? Uh, so I went incognito and I asked uh, Avid and Phantom their acceleration and speed cap capabilities. And if you look at like some of the videos before those machines, like this basically goes at the same speed. Um, there's a big weight difference, especially with the Phantom, um, bec because uh, like we were saying, the limiting factor of the alt mill is sort of like the structural vibration dampening part. And although we haven't really seen any issues with cutting at really, really fast speeds. Um, it's an easy way to throw money at a problem is just make things heavier and yeah. easier. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so basically what I saw is that the alt mill can run as fast, if not faster, especially because it's a, a lot of the parts are lighter. They can move, they can accelerate faster and slow down faster as well. They don't need as much power to get to those speeds. Mm -hmm. And obviously the, there's a lot of optimization in the rigidity of the machine. So the rigidity factors like more into the end mill than anything else. So in a practical sense, there's a lot of applications where an alt mill can replace an industrial level machine. And uh, I think we might see a lot of people who, when they're setting up their shops, when they're like getting into production level stuff, that this is gonna be a pretty strong contender. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Definitely not like all cases, it's uh, equivalent or like suitable replacement. Like if you're, you know, giant cabinet shop making like 200 million a year, it's like, okay, you probably have all the money to spend on a 6,000 pound machine, but. You know, I think if you're starting out or you're looking for like a second machine that can keep up with production, like, yeah, definitely. Um, kind of, I guess what Andy mentioned is like the speed. Um, more importantly is the acceleration is like this machine is able to be a lot more nimble than a larger steel machine just because of the weight of gantries and things like that. So yeah, it definitely helps you save a lot of time when you have a lot of detailed work there zooming around and you need to get from location to location really fast. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, is there anything else? I think that really. covers pretty much everything. Obviously, we can go deep dive, but yeah, like we could continue talking for hours, yeah. I guess. But check but the blog out, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, should we go through some of the questions yeah. we got on the cards? I'll just split this. Sure. Yeah. I think they're yeah okay. Um. Should I go first? I'll go first. Sure. Okay, first question. Do you perceive any major changes between versions one, um, 
version 1.1, etc., that will make initial batches incompatible with later options? And if so, will upgrades be available, especially if this is the first revision? Um, well, this is more like a, if, if we know we're gonna change it, why didn't we just change it now sort of situation, mm. right? Mm -hmm. um, we've done a lot of testing with the Altmill so far, and we've gone through some iterations as well. Yeah. So <coughs> do we think there's gonna be major changes? No. I think performance-wise, like we said before, no. Like, if there are any changes we were gonna make, we'd probably make it less rigid. <laughs> <laughs> like it's really it's kind of overshoot it's overshot what we were actually targeting, so we could like we could technically afford to make it less rigid. Um, obviously, we're not going to do that, but yeah, yeah, it, the, nothing performance or capability wise we have planned. I think there's like some things that will change between prototype version and the production version. So mm -hmm. like um, the anodized uh, aluminum gantries, and they're they have a lot more bits to them, I guess. Mm. Um, the motors, they might not be the same ones because we're testing a whole bunch that, to find the best one. Um, some of the, some small changes to the profile of the legs. Um, yeah. Oh, and the dust shields. We might have the oh, dust yes. shields, right? Yeah. I think yeah. we actually have them here somewhere. They're lost. Yeah. Anyways. Anyway. They're, but they're just stainless steel shields that go on here so yeah. that the chips don't get on the linear guys. They so look much. mildly cool. Yeah. But. Oh, oh Scott, he's got one. You want to show them? I guess you can show them. Oh, yeah. Ta da! Big giant piece of stainless steel. Yeah, so they'll go like over here. Pretty much, yeah. Ooh. Okay. Cool. Oh. What's next? Do, do, do. What is the rigidity of Mark II compared to this? I guess we talked about that. Um, in the y-axis direction, it's about eight times more rigid. Uh, in the x-axis, I don't remember the number off my head, but probably similar amount. Cool. It's so fun to just toss them though, right? Uh, no, 14, are the spindles water-cooled? Uh, no, as we said, no. Um, just because of the ease of um, setting it up, but there, are, if you do decide to get your own spindle, there is enough space in the drag chains to add the uh, coolant lines, and you can even add the the uh, air lines as too mm. if you want to go for a tool changer spindle as well. Any plans for a smaller version? Uh, I guess we didn't really give a complete answer, but yeah, it's essentially possible. Um, I guess no immediate plans right away, but maybe it's on the horizon. Yeah, uh, I mean, the, the plan was sort of like, if we can get, if we got scrap rails, then we just chop them. Yeah. And then just make the shorter <laughs> one from that. Because that's essentially what it is. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, yeah, so. Uh, is there gonna be an ability to edit inputs and outputs on the controller to add something like a button for pneumatic clamps and something like that? Uh, so yeah, if you look up the, so there will be resources coming out for SLB like very, very, very soon because I think they're probably going to start shipping these like within the next week. Mm. Um, but I, there are like relay inputs and outputs as well as like input, like a whole bunch of inputs and outputs so you can add the buttons. Uh, by default, the SLB has uh, uh, for the e-stop, there's like macro buttons, programmable mm. macro buttons. I don't know if we have one here. I have one, I can just yeah. yoink it. Is it stuck? It's stuck. Okay. Oh. Oh, there it is. Yeah, so you got, oh, this has no buttons on it. Anyways, there's buttons, I yeah. swear. There's normally three buttons. Um, yeah, so there will be, there's be programmable buttons on the e-stop itself. So you can say, we can make the machine do stuff when you press the button, or you can wire in your own buttons, so. There's like a bajillion options for that. And Gsender has like a, like a- Custom macro. Yeah, custom macro options so you can add those things as well. Cool. Any consideration for a version that will fit the whole heavier duty machine in a sub four by four footprint? Uh, I guess, what is the footprint of this thing? This is probably like near five by six-ish feet footprint. So yeah, I guess that's sort of in the realm of the other question, smaller machines like, uh, yeah. Not really. 
read the question to everyone. Oh, yes. Any consideration for a version that will fit the whole heavier duty machine in a sub 4x4 footprint? So, yeah, like kind of like we talked about before, is yeah, it's kind of on the horizon. No immediate plans for today, but yeah. I guess if it wasn't obvious, the reason it's four foot by four foot is because uh, regular sheet material is four by eight, so it's half yeah. of that. And if we made it smaller, then you have to make awkward cuts to fit it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, uh, what are the main key differences between the alt mill and the Mark II? Long, I'm assuming that's the long mill Mark II. Well, that's a long conversation, which gets answered in the uh, blog, but. If I had to break it down into a few things, the first is um, who are they for? So the long mill was designed to be a beginner friendly machine to get people into the hobby, to make it accessible, to make it easy. Um, and for us to be able to do that, we've made the machine as affordable as possible while still being useful for making projects. And we have a whole myriad of resources, tutorials and things that we do to help those users use the long mill. So if you're like, I have no idea what a CNC machine is, machine is, I don't know how a CNC machine works, I just wanna get into it and I don't have, like I'm on a budget, the long mill is a great option. The alt mill on the other hand is, I want a machine that I can get a lot of value out of as much as possible, whether that be money or being able to do a lot of projects or do a lot of variety of different projects. Um, we designed the alt mill to be, as I said, the best intersection between the, co the cost, the performance, and the uh, cost, performance, and value of the machine. So, um, you know, it can, it can do things faster than the long mill, more accurately and more reliably than, than, than the long mill. So and different to make, materials. Huh? And different materials. Yeah, and, and generally cut harder materials faster. So yeah, if your plan is, I want to do a business, I want to make money from this, this is a good step up from there. Obviously, the price point of the machine is pretty comparable with most of the hobbyist machines. And so what, I, what we believe is that people are going to also get it for hobby use. Um, and that's also totally fine because the, the way that the long mill and the alt mill works workflow wise, the software and the process is almost exactly the same. So if you know how to use a long mill, you will almost certainly know how to use an alt mill. Cool. Will there be a beginner's kit or something akin to it? So yeah, with the long mill, we actually right now offer a beginner's kit, which is sort of a bundle. It's your machine, dust shoe, bits, anything you need to get like up and running, the basics. Um, yeah, I, maybe you can answer this better. Um, so I guess it, to have some uh, background on why the beginner's kit exists, the first is because we kept getting the question, what should I get with the machine? And rather than having to answer the question over and over again, we just made a kit that had everything we thought you should get to start mm. using the machine. Um, in a way, the alt mill is sort of in that direction where um, we have the alt mill machine itself and the spindle. And I think on that list of things, the extra things you need is the waste board, a computer, and the end mills. Mm -hmm. Assuming you buy both the end mill, uh, sorry, the spindle and the, the machine. Um, I feel like they're slightly, it's slightly less complicated. And also, um, yeah, it's slightly less complicated, but we may, like, it depends on how, what sort of customers we end up getting. If people are like, I want, I want everything all together in a bundle, then, you know, our, your wishes are command, like, yeah. we, can, we can do that. As I was saying, a big part of what we do is making sure that we make the things in scale to bring down the cost. So there's a lot of consideration in how many of these are we going to sell and also how much time can we save overall and how can we pass those savings along to the customer. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, steel, titanium, how big and beefy a spindle can you mount? Ah. Do we have it? We don't have it. 
No, we don't. I milled a bunch of steel uh, the other day. And sorry, I know this is your question, I guess. No, you can answer okay. it. Well, yeah, we milled a bit of steel. Um, we hit like 1.8 inches squared or inches cubed per minute in terms of material removal rate. Like for context, that's really fast. Like that's, I think most of my cuts in the long mill and like hardwood or something typically are about that. Um, maybe even like some softwood I typically cut around there. Uh, so yeah, that it's quite competent in steel. It does quite all right. Um, it's not designed around milling steel or anything, but you can certainly do it. Um, titanium, I can't speak of. I've been looking right recently for somewhere to buy some titanium because we do want to try cutting some and we'll definitely have a video out on that if we end up getting our hands on any. But yeah, if anyone in the Kitchen and Waterloo region wants to drop by and give us some titanium, if you have a project in mind, we'll, we'll do it for you, I guess. But uh, that's next on our list for sure, titanium. Maybe someone has a spare hip or something. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but, you know, some foreshadowing, uh, it, Michael's ordered a giant block of aluminum to make a guitar. Oh, has he? Yeah. How big is it? It's guitar sized. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Like what thickness? Two inches? Two inches. Yeah. Okay. Two inch block of oh my God. aluminum blank. Uh, so <sighs> we're going to make a guitar from that. Yeah. And um, yeah, that was, that blank was like $550. <laughs> it's going to be a very expensive guitar yeah but you know i mean like hardwood is hardwood's also expensive it is yeah it i is. know scott probably spent that on his guitar trials no okay anyway. uh, anyways yeah so keep an eye out for that cool. if you want to buy we want to send a two inch thick <laughs> block of steel we'll make or a block steel of guitar. titanium i don't think you'd want to play with a titanium guitar why not i don't feel like that'd be comfortable to hold it's like 60 pounds or something probably oh we can skeletonize it i guess yeah um anyways yeah so cool just curious as to what controller this machine will use is the question uh so i guess we covered that it's going to be using the alt mill variation of the super longboard controller um you can see the original super longboard slv controller here so same form factor same um, functionality just tailored for the alt mill in the, in the most recent video update, I saw the alt mill cutting a, aluminum on a vice on tracks. Will that be available to purchase? I'm assuming they're talking about this. Oh, one. this sketchy setup. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but not from us. Yeah, yeah, I don't think we will be selling a vice or anything. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's not an ideal setup. You can see we have six T-track clamps because the vice kept slipping when we were cutting harder. Um, yeah. Yeah, but you can buy a milling vice from many places. Yeah. Can I use G-Sender? Yes, you can use G-Sender for sure. What's the difference between lead screws and bolt screws? Uh, okay, well, that's a, that's a big question. So I guess I can start with lead screws. So lead screws are basically just threaded rods and then you have a nut that's also threaded, and that interface allows the nut to move back and forth as the lead screw spins. And um, that's what we use for the long wheel. In terms of ball screws, it's very much the same thing, except if you look at the profile of the ball screw, they're, uh, what's the best word? They're spherical. Yeah. It's a spherical thread. It's a race for a ball bearing to exactly. thread yeah. in. Yeah. So because these are, spher these are spherical, because inside the ball nut, there's a recirculating set of balls that basically uh, roll around the ball and recirculate through the nut so that uh, it, when you turn the lead screw, that whole system moves the machine. Bet uh, the benefit of the ball screw is that typically it's lower friction and there's higher accuracy. Um, and no backlash. Yeah, yeah, basically no backlash. Um, the benefits of a lead screw is that the, it's much cheaper um, and it's much simpler. Uh, but the downside is that typically there's a bit more backlash and typically there's um, more, more backlash. What's the other word I was thinking of? 
Friction, sorry. Mm. Yes, there's typically more friction. In this specific application, it's not that big of a difference. Um, but actually, maybe that's not so, maybe that's not true. No, the friction is a big difference, I guess. Yeah. Like, I guess the, it's quite involved to explain it, but you're, there's a pitch to every lead screw, every ball screw, and that's essentially just means for every rotation of the ball screw, how far is your thing going to move? In our case, that's 10 millimeters. So you rotate the screw once, 10 millimeter moves. Um, if you want to go to a higher pitch like that, uh, it means you have more friction between the nut and screw interface. So using a ball screw kind of helps a lot with that and kind of allows us to get those higher speeds without a lot of extra friction. Mm -hmm. I think where the ball screws are important for on a machine like the alt mill is that it carries a lot of inertia. So it needs to like move uh, quickly. Um, actually, maybe I can show the video of you standing on top of the z-axis. Oh, yeah, right. That's a funny one. Yeah. Are we still streaming here? Uh, OK, let's stream again. I just have to call you, Louis, right? Yeah, I guess the background of the video you're about to see is that um, our other engineer, Johan, was asking me, like, how much force could the z-axis apply? And I would crunch the numbers. It's like somewhere around like six, of, six to 700 pounds or something absurd. So I was like, okay, um, surely if I stand on this, it'll lift me. And uh, yeah, I guess we'll see the video evidence of that. All right, I'm ready to play. Ready? Cool. What a ridiculous video. We Don't play it again? OK, I'll play it again. So yeah, like, it's kind of a funny illustration. We've had people, um, you know, we've had people see issues holding these, like, 11 kilogram spindles on their long mill, um, just with the z-axis kind of drooping down. Um, yeah, or this kind of should answer any concerns of like, can I hold this really heavy spindle? Yeah, you probably park like a smart car on it if you wanted. Um, <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> yeah, we were talking about doing like a marketing video where we take our um, force gauge and mm. just crushing yeah. it like an app, uh, like a can. Yeah, but that's I don't know. Yeah, we have we have a lot of ideas. Yeah, bad ideas. Can, like, video of alt mill towing a car. So, yeah. Huh? Hmm? It didn't tow Oh. Okay. Well, it's you know it was just flowing around. Yeah. I think we were also gonna take like Mike's truck and try and like um, park one of the wheels on the X rail. Um, we didn't get around to doing that. Yeah. But. But yeah, I mean, anyways. Uh, Funny stuff. Yeah. So I guess just. To continue on that, like another nice thing about that uh, z-axis is that you can also turn off your machine, and even with the motor turned off, it's just it's strong enough that it won't let itself backdrive. If you have a spindle that weighs under like 40 pounds, you're probably fine. It, it's not going to backdrive itself down. So even if you have a power outage, like you're not going to lose any of your z-position um, or crash anything. If that's something. Can I use it to change my tires? I so want to try that now. Can you? Hmm. How much does a tire machine need to press? Would 500 pounds work? I don't know. I guess we should find out. Just buy, buy a machine, Jack. You can find out for yourself. Yeah. Anyways. What's next? Oh, right, we're still doing questions. Um, will the super longboard controller be with the alt mill? If not, when will this be available? Uh, I guess we kind of answered this. Um, it will be. I keep getting all the controller questions. I think we can just skip anything that we've already answered. Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, I'll just go to the next one. Um, by pre-ordering it, can we still add other accessories before shipping? Uh, maybe you can answer this. Uh, so if you order it, if you order the alt mill now and then add stuff to your cart at the same time, they will ship with the alt mill, so you will get it later down the line. If if um, if you so I think some people are 
order the machine but not the spindle, uh, we'll make a spindle page so you can order them together and we'll sort that out after the fact. Um, and some of the items, we do need to create resources and the wiring harnesses for them, like the vortex uh, and the laser beam, for example. So some of these things have to happen later. So you can order them now and we can sort that out with the alt mill orders, or you can order them later and we'll make sure all of that, all, all of that goes sorted out. So uh, yeah, you can order accessories if you'd like. Uh, is it possible to increase the Z axis height in the future? Um, yes, it totally is. Yeah. Um, that's like one of those weird uh, specifications that we we're kind of having a lot of back and forth on. It's like, it's one of those arbitrary things where it's like you make your Z taller, now you can fit a bigger piece of material, but also now your entire machine is like slightly weaker. So it's like you're just trading off two things and you kind of have to just make that decision at some point, like what are we going to, kind of settle on, what are we gonna balance on? Um, so yeah, we have, it's been a while, I don't remember the exact number, I think five and a half inches of clearance under the Z gantry, or under the entire gantry. So you'll be able to fit giant slab of wood. Um, as far as making it taller in the future, sure. Like the machine can mill aluminum, as you've seen. Uh, we're gonna have all the um, CAD model for this available as well. You can just take these super big plates go on and buy yourself a big piece of aluminum and stretch these out even taller and you know make whatever you want, I guess. Uh, if that's like a super common requested thing, maybe we might offer that as an upgrade and you can swap out those plates, raise it up a bit. But yeah, uh, as it stands, I guess, it seems like five and a half inches is a lot of Z travel or Z clearance. Yeah, because um, so yeah. for practical purposes, the limiting factor on how deep or how much you can cut is typically on the length of the bit, yeah. which, um, yeah, five inch bit is mm -hmm. like pretty long. Yeah. So if you're, yeah, <laughs> that's really long anyways. Yeah. So practically it kind of like doesn't make ton of sense to go too crazy, mm -hmm. but I mean, we, you could slash we could. Yeah. Cool. Is it my turn or your turn? It doesn't matter. Turn. Okay. Can it be mounted and run vertically? Uh, this is a common question we've gotten on the long mill um, quite often, but uh, I guess we don't know. I can't say that with absolute certainty. I don't see why not. Um, you know, it's a pretty heavy machine, so you don't want to have like 200 pounds come flying down at you. So for liability reasons, I'll say maybe don't do that, but I can't stop you. So go ahead and do whatever you want. Um, if you do happen to disobey us and do that, I don't think you'd have any issues, to be honest. Like we've talked about before, these are closed loop stepper motors. Um, you shouldn't have any kind of droop over time. Um, the motors are powerful enough to support the weight of most of the components on here. So yeah, you'd probably be fine hypothetically, but yeah. It is important to mention that uh, it's also not super, I, I've tried it, like not with this, with the long mill, and it's not super practical because you gotta lift up the material and like put it yeah. there. And when you start cutting and things like fall out and it's a whole thing. Mm. So I feel like realistically- Unless you have see. a vacuum, like this is a thing on like super big industrial CNCs. It's like, yeah, they have them like slanted or vertically, but yeah, you usually would have a vacuum and it's like, okay, I'm only doing sheet goods and I'm only doing this one thing. It's like, then it maybe makes sense from like a floor space perspective, but yeah. Probably the wrong machine for you if you're concerned with that. So, uh, next question is: What are the repeatability numbers like? Uh, I guess theoretically they're at the limitation of the backlash in the ball screws. So that should be like very, very minor, very small, like probably in the range of like one hour or less. Um, the motors themselves are super repeatable. Uh, they use like a 12-bit. Um, magnetic encoder on them, they're like, you're, yeah, you're basically not going to be limited by any of the motor's precision or any of the control precision. It's mostly just the motion system and anything. Like if you have a screw that's loose and it's rocking left to right or whatever is maybe your biggest concern. I guess to answer that simply, it's like, yeah, you're probably in the range of like one thou, one thousandth of an inch or something small, very inconsequential. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you want some more cards? Oh, I'll give you some more right. cards. Uh, will it come with a touch plate or and dust boot, or will that be extra like the Mark II? Um, so the touch plate you can buy separately. Uh, the dust boot is part of the kit with the um, spindle right now. We will have all of those options available as extras, um, just in maybe maybe a couple of weeks. Uh, so yeah. Cool. Required electrical supply. Uh, so yeah, the controller and motion system runs on its own um, power supply from 110 volt or 120, 110, 120. Um, if you have uh, 240 or 220 volt only, you'll need to get a transformer or kind of figure that out somehow to power that. You can also get a different power supply if needed. We'll have more information on that. Uh, and then the spindle, like we've talked about, is a 110, 120 volt spindle sit setup. So yeah, you'll just need those two things. Do you need to use different work holding methods with the alt mill? Um, I think the working holding methods are pretty much the same as the long mill. Um, so if you want to check out what we've written resources about, you can check out um, the long mill resources for now. We'll be writing the uh, resources for the alt mill soon. So yeah. Will there be support for a rotary slash fourth axis? Uh, so yeah, that's following the exact same um, support as with the long mill and our uh, existing vortex rotary axis. So yeah, that's a fourth axis unit that fits onto the bed of the machine. And yeah, with the new super long board, you'll be able to do a uh, true four axis simultaneous milling if you have a cam package that allows that. Um, yeah. Uh, can you explain what closed loop stepper means? Um, I think we explained this earlier. Basically, it's kind of like a stepper motor, except it has an encoder. So the sensor and the driver can work together to understand the position of the motor. Um, it does lead to the motors being a lot faster and more efficient because it can basically push uh, more power on the fly as it rotates. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's actually super nice for um, like anyone in a really hot environment. Um, with the long mill and other like open loop machines, open loop motor machines, uh, if you leave the motors on, like holding current on their own, they'll just slowly heat up and you might get them up to like 50 degrees, 60 degrees, which is normal, but very hot. Um, on these closed loop motors, they don't actually generate much heat when they're at a standstill. So if there's nothing reacting on the machine, if it's not being exerted with force or anything and they're just sitting, they don't really get warm at all. Like they're just cool to the chart cool to the touch pretty much always until you start moving. Uh, oh, it's me, right. Uh, what will warranty look like on this unit? Um, I think we, I don't remember what our, we put down. I think it was a 90 day. Okay. Or Check the product page. Okay, uh, it's on the yeah, product page. Yeah, it's on the product page. Cool. Same, same like kind of process slash deal with the, uh, Long mill, as a long mill. Uh, are there any plans to make an even larger size machine? Nothing like specifically in the works, but we do get a lot of people that mention it. So probably, possibly. Uh, computer slash laptop required, question mark. Software compatibility, question mark. Um, so yeah, you'll need a computer or a laptop or both. Um, and uh, software compatibility wise, it's compatible with pretty much anything you've used with the long mill or other hobby CNC machines. Um, it's essentially just acting as a normal Gerbil style machine. So you can send any kind of G code that you've generated for that. Uh, and yeah, we have an entire like software wizard on our resources page, kind of helping you navigate all the different options there are for software. It's like a little overwhelming, but they're pretty much all compatible with this machine. How easy it will it be to get a level surface with the waste board? Um, I would say pretty easy because you slap on a, a surfacing bit and then G-Sender has the surfacing tool. So plug in your, the size that you want to surface and let it fly. Um, yeah. I think surfacing for this, we're running it like super fast. Uh, it was like 
I don't know, yeah. six minutes or something. We do have a video, Five minutes. I think, here. So the funny story behind this, I think we mentioned in the video, was like, we're running the surfacing bit, and this is the very first thing we ran, obviously, with the prototype machine after we built it. So it's like, okay, we're so excited. Let's run the surfacing bit and surface the machine so we can use it. And uh, I was running it the whole time. I was like, okay, like, it looks all right. Like, the chips look kind of weird, but it's fine. And then I noticed it was burning in some spots. I was like, oh, okay, it's like, maybe it's the bit's dull. And then uh, I, uh, I was like, okay, fine, whatever. Set it up to cut some aluminum now. And I'm trying to cut the aluminum, and it's like, oh my god, it's like not cutting at all. Like, it's like so awful. Like, this machine sucks. We built something really bad. It's not cutting aluminum. Like, what did we do? I was having a just panic. And then uh, Jason, our customer support manager, comes by, and he's like, hmm, I think your bit's spinning backwards. So anyways, <laughs> we were, I was trying to cut aluminum, and the bit's spinning backwards. And then I realized, oh, I surfaced this whole waste board. So this uh, video you're watching of it surfacing, the bit's actually spinning backwards. There's literally no cutting edge on the bit, <laughs> but it's doing it at like, what speed is that? Like 8,000 or 9,000 millimeters per minute or something? And like quite deep. Uh, yeah. It's frozen. Oh, it's frozen. Yeah. It's hilarious though. So anyways, we uh, cleaned it up after that and it was normal, but just a funny story, I guess. Mm -hmm. Always check your spindle wearing. I mean, you won't have to worry about that with our spindle kit, but, you know, always check. <laughs> uh, yeah. I did also, like, surface that project back here, and then I crashed it, and I bent the oh, I heard. surfacing tool shaft. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, that's the common theme is, like, a lot of the, like, mishaps tend to be with bits bending or breaking now. It's like we're in the realm of, like, bits are the limitation, so, yeah. Uh, will Easel support the new hardware? I guess that's um, answered in my last one. It is compatible with any kind of Gerbil software, so Easel included. I'm just going to skip that or pretend I skipped it. Um, what is the future of the long mill? Um, I guess I was just talking to Andy about this recently, like last night. Um, just like any changes, things we might want to change on the long mill. Uh, there are some very minor changes, and I think we were like kind of trying to dub a name for any of the newer machines that we're going to be shipping out with those changes. So you might have seen these rolled out already. We have uh, anti-backlash nuts that Andy's been developing and testing. We have a new style of clamping Acme locking nut. Um, we have our middle feet, which are now injection molded, and probably some other stuff as well. Uh, oh, yeah, obviously the new, <laughs> I'm sorry, Chris, <laughs> uh, the new control board that we've been <laughs> developing. <laughs> Um, as well, will at some point be shipped with the kits. Um, yeah, I don't think there's, oh, and router mount things we're discussing as well. So, yeah, it's mostly like small tweaks here and there that will make up changes on the long wheel, but, you know, it's pretty optimized for what it does, and I think, like, yeah, not many complaints on most things, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, next question, can we put wheels on it to roll around the shop? Um, if you cut fast enough, it'll roll around the shop on its own. Mm. Uh, but I think the, these are 10, M10. Yeah, these are M10. So you, should, you can probably get casters that will fit underneath. Yeah, like a standard caster, well not standard, but they exist as a 3 8 inch stud on a caster. So you theoretically you could just slide that through, bolt it all together, and you'd have a caster. Um, yeah, I would recommend, I guess I should say, I would recommend not doing that. Like the machine will just, it'll just be wobbling everywhere. Like it's not a, it's not going to be a fun time. Even if you get the locking caster, they're still just going to pivot and wobble around. Uh, I've seen like fancier caster types where it's got like a shroud that'll drop down and kind of anchor. Those are fine. Like if you just want to put something to quickly move around. I'm sure we'll see some people coming up with some crazy setups to like dolly their machine around the whole shop and stuff. And it's super cool to see, but yeah. Oh, it's me. Right. Uh, how will the machine, how will the alt mill stack up to the one Finity CNC machine? What are the differences and such? Uh, I guess stack up wise, um, you know, they kind of, they're comparable, they're 
in the same kind of market-ish. Uh, main differences are obviously the rigidity. So, you know, that's something we've been touting a lot of is like, it's very rigid. Um, yeah, that's basically about it. I mean, yeah. I don't know, do you have the any price thought? is like there. It's, I think, yeah. all together, it's maybe like 1000 to $1,500 cheaper mm -hmm. USD. Um, obvious, and also like, we're cool. <laughs> 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 Just kidding. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know. Uh, they're very comparable. Like, I'm not here to slander anyone or talk ill on any other machines. I have a lot of respect for the design. It's very elegant. But I think there are some inherent limitations in rigidity. Um, you know, it's kind of the trade-off of using your frame as the motion system. It's like super elegant in that sense, but you're limited by how rigid that can possibly be. So, yeah. But cool. How hard is it to build an enclosure for it? Uh, it depends on how good you're at building enclosures, I guess. Well, it is like f about five and a half feet wide and I think about six feet deep, roughly. I think the official numbers are on the website. So, you know, you can build a box around it. I think if you use the slots here, um, you can probably get to like doing some of it. Yeah. I guess the tricky part is that it's wider than four feet. So it's, it's back in the realm of what we're talking about with workbenches where you need to find material that's somehow wider than four feet, which is not easy to do. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. um, what else is what was I gonna say? Yeah, the uh, enclosure. The lip. Any, I don't know. Oh, um, this will be like the model, like the CAD files will be available as we always share open source and stuff. Uh, yeah, it should be point. pretty easy to design. Yeah, at some that. point. So, and you could probably cut the parts on the alt mill itself. So yeah. maybe someone will design an enclosure and then share the files and we'll see enclosures everywhere. Cool. Will there be longer T-Tracks available for the longer table? Uh, so yeah, like this is our first machine, I guess, that has a Y-axis travel that's four, four feet as opposed to 30 inches. Um, so yeah, naturally you would maybe want longer T-Tracks. Uh, I guess my counter argument to that is that like you usually want T-Tracks when you're holding small things. So little projects and you maybe want them just at the front. Uh, you'll typically just end up doing that and you'll have all the T-Track travel you need for that. But yeah, if you're holding like full large sheets of things, I don't know, you might be screwing things down in the corners or something along those lines. So it might not be as useful as you think um, to have those longer T-Tracks. We don't have those on our machine, obviously. It's kind of been fine. Um, that being said, you know, it's pretty easy for us to just make a longer version, just cut them shorter, or cut them longer. Um, so, yeah, we'll see if we end up doing that. Uh, is it possible to pick up to avoid delivery and charges? Uh, yep, so when you place the order, there's a local pickup option. Um, it is only available for people within Ontario because we got a lot of people from Saskatchewan and stuff. Hey, I'd like to pick up. Oh, it'll, we'll be there in three days. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, so if, if, it's a, if you're in the area, yeah, you can pick it up. If you did end up ordering it and paying for shipping and you'd like to pick it up, just let us know in advance before we ship it and then we can change it to the local pickup and refund you for the shipping. Um, that being said, a lot of people ask this because they're like, can I get this sooner? And what I found is that because people are busy, like when the machine is ready, it'll ship right away. It'll ship within like, like we'll get it out on a truck as, as soon as the machine is ready, right? But most people, they have to, you know, they have work, they got schedules, they need to find time to drive over here and that can be an extra couple of days. And because most of the machine, like the transit time to get from our shop to within Ontario is usually like two days, most, most of the time, it's faster actually to ship it. And I think the shipping price is not that bad. Uh, it's like between 150 to $250. So yeah, you know, it's up to you. Cool. When will pre-orders be shipped? Uh, yeah, so we're currently aiming for July for the first batch of 50 machines to go out. No, that's May for the first 50. 
Oh, okay. And then July for the okay, never mind. For everything else. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But you can find more details on our website, like long, long details. Yeah. Cool. Um, actual table size. Um, Does that mean like outer sizes? You can find exact numbers on the website. I think it's a. I think about five and a half feet and then 49 inches of cutting space, 49 yeah. and a half roughly. Yeah, I guess we'll mention the cutting area again is like we give a little bit of margin usually. So this is like a four foot by four foot, but it's actually an extra inch or a bit, inch and a bit on the X and Y direction. Just to allow for those weird cases where you need the extra space. Mm -hmm. Will it run on Gerbil? No. Uh, I mean, it'll be Gerbil Hal, so it'll be compatible, backwards compatible with Gerbil. Uh, are you going to offer any discounted kits like the Beginner's Kit? I guess we talked about that. Will customs slash duties be included in price, like with Long Mill? Um, you probably know. Yeah, more. so if you're in the US, yes. Um, if you're not in the US, then no. But there will be sales tax for some, pro uh, some states. And uh, you will see if that's the case when you check out, uh, because we have too many customers in some states, and the American government wants us to pay taxes. Uh, yeah, so we will have it as a delivered DDP option um, for the shipments to the US. Uh, if that changes, we will reflect that on the website, and you'll know before you order. So uh, yeah. And uh, my last question here is, can we buy the spindle kit separately or, or only with the purchase of an alt mill? So uh, yeah, I think with me and Daniel slash other people have talked about this. Um, we will take your money. Like <laughs> we don't think it's a great idea to put the big spindle on the long mill because of the weight restriction, like the weight, weight, weight reasons and where it's sort of like overkill for the long mill. Um, but I know a lot of people do put the spindles on their machine and they're, they work pretty okay. And I think for the price point of what the spindle is and the fact that they work for both systems, like the wiring is the same and everything. Yeah, like if you wanna buy them, buy an alt mill spindle for the long mill, like we'll, let, we'll take your money. Um, we won't like specifically support it probably unless we can like actually say, oh, this is like a really good option. Um, so that's sort of the general answer. Uh, right now, we don't have a, a page so people can order the spindle. Uh, we will have that pretty soon. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. I will mention also that the CNC router project with the brushless DC motor that Johan's working on, that's supposed to be the, the better option. One, because it has almost the same power as a spindle. It has all the speed control. It's quieter, it's more accurate, so on and so forth. And it plugs and plays with the long mill. That's a project that's still like quite a ways away. And you can read more about the development on the production updates that I like to write. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think the key thing is like, a lot of people want to upgrade to the spindle kit on the long mill or upgrade to a spindle on the long mill. Um, a lot of, because of the automated like on and off functionality at like a start of the job and then uh, as well as the speed control stuff. And I guess lastly is the noise. So it's like, yeah, our hope is that the spindle, CNC spindle project will kind of just at least address those and yeah. Well, actually, really no when I did the sur when I put out a survey for like how do people use spindles, mm. I think we had like over 250 responses, and out of like the people using the spindles, only like 20 to 25 percent actually use the oh, really? actual connection. Yeah. Oh. I think partially because okay, well, deep diving into this, you have zero to five volt PWM, you have zero to ten volt analog, you have RS485. And then you have like all, all, the, all these really obscure communication protocols. And it's like kind of not in the, you know, you got to sort all these out. And obviously we're talking about the program, programming part of yeah. the VFDs, which is complicated. So in practice, what I've seen is that a lot of people don't actually use the full potential of what the spindle can do, which is even more like wasteful. 
or yeah kind of it's like you're not getting you're not getting the benefits of the spin like all of the benefits of the spindle mm -hmm. because of a technical barrier obviously once we delve into this and we can close that gap um but yeah i mean in in the practical use based on this these results one the the actual most people use the potentiometer on the on the face of the spindle to like actually turn it on and off mm -hmm. and, and control it and uh yeah i think basically most people buy it because of the noise mm. that's like the most important part that we i've seen why people actually upgrade to spindles power also is a factor but i think um when i most of the people responding is your makita router powerful enough like pretty much everyone was like yeah it's totally mm. fine so yeah, sound, sound. Cool. Is that oh, all cool. our cards? Yeah. Cool. Okay. Should we? We'll open up for questions on the online channel, and then um, I guess we'll wrap it up from there. I guess so. Yeah. So. Let's just have it so that people on the chat they post their questions now. If like I'm assuming the people posting the questions aren't going to ask questions that were already already asked, so uh, yeah, just just post them now, and uh, we'll spend what like 20 minutes, 15 yeah. 20 minutes talking. So uh, yeah, do your worst. I can do these ones quickly. Uh, do do will you spend the work with the 30 by 30 Mark II? We just talked about that, I guess. When is the super long board shipping? Hopefully next week, right? Or yeah, something, the first like, week. like as we have them now, so yeah. we have everything yeah. now. So it's only a matter of time. Da, 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 da. Can we use the stepper motors used on the alt mill for the long mill? Theoretically, yes, but you would need a different control board. You know, I'm sure we'll see someone doing this, but we don't officially support it or have plans as of now. Uh, t -t 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 -t. I've or purchased an SLB. Can I order that and have the cost reduced? I don't know. I guess you can just re cancel your order, or how does that work? Uh, yes. Well, I think they're asking if this SLB can be used on the alt mill, which is a no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you don't need, if you're getting, if you bought the SLB and anticipate to use it for the alt mill, then you should cancel the order for the board. If you plan to use it on the long mill, obviously you can use it for the long mill, but they're not interchangeable. And the alt mill will, for clarity, have its own. Alt mill SLB with it. it. You don't have to buy that yeah. separately. Mm -hmm. Is a single is a VFD single phase in and three out? Yes, correct. Bingo. Uh, will the dust collector power on with or at spindle startup? You can set that up, but uh, you require a separate external relay to switch that mains power going to your dust collector. Um, we have a common one that we recommend. It's on a resources page. It's sold by a company called Digital Loggers, I believe. It's just a little kind of power extension thing, and you can plug into an input on your uh, super long board or regular long board, anything. Um, how will production batches, oh, these are the new questions now. Yeah, okay, so how will production batches work? So right now we um, have the first 50 order for the first batch, uh, which is like the, like the test batch essentially. Um, right now we're taking orders for the first main batch which will be like the, the production production version. Um, if you, what we're basically doing right now is seeing how many people order and then ordering to meet the demand, essentially. So it's a pre-order. Um, once that's done, we'll basically do exactly how we do things for the long mill, which is we order machines in batches and we produce them in, uh, in batches and you'll be in whatever batch. The goal is to make it so that you don't have to wait for the machine. Um, but realistically, we don't know the demand yet. And we also don't know, um, we also don't know uh, like how the growth of the sales will look like. And typically speaking, um, we don't want to risk too much on buying too much stuff. So there's a bit of a catch up phase, probably in the first year yeah. until um, you know, we iron those things out. Just for clarity, when he says test batch, he doesn't mean you're like a beta tester or anything. It's, there are gonna be no changes between like the first and after that first 50. Yeah, it's uh, most, it's, it's most. Sorry. I think you mean test in the sense of like testing the market, 
really? Well, it's more like or test the production side. Yeah, so like I guess so. The yeah. assembly process, the packaging process, like yeah. um, we just ordered 50 sets to start that process. Yeah. Yeah. But on, in terms, like we are going to, like in terms of the hardware itself, it'll be the same. Yeah. Uh, can the spindle kit be used on machines with 10, 0 to 10 volt control? Yeah, you uh, totally could. Yeah. We'll have to see, I guess, whether we'll have resources for doing that immediately or when that would be. But yeah, it's very possible. Uh, do you have any plans for G Center to support Raspberry Pi 5? Um, I don't know exactly, but I think the support for 32 bit is drop slash dropping. Um, you can look at the resources for, uh, and, the, and the GitHub to see what the support is for Raspberry Pi right now. Also, we've done a lot of testing on Raspberry Pi in the past, and GCender is a pretty big program, so you might see some performance issues. Uh, yeah, there is like, a, uh, what I would probably suggest is to find a small computer rather than using a Raspberry Pi because the performance will be better and there's more support for networking and things like that. Um, I have like some work that I'm doing in terms of like small computer stuff that will be pretty affordable. Uh, but that will come a little bit later. Uh, can you reiterate the advantages of your $515 spindle kit over cheaper kits from Amazon, eBay, AliExpress? Is it better quality, blah, 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 blah. Yeah, so like I was saying, I've done a lot of testing with like the really cheap spindles and some of them are fine. And I think most of the time, if you're just using them for hobby use, they're also fine. It's kind of a lottery though. Yeah, it's sort of a lottery. Yeah. Like what we're trying to do is make sure that the spindles that we do source is as high quality as possible and they meet all the specs that we need and we make sure that the safety part of it is good. So I it's, think, yeah. yeah, I think partially you get what you pay for. Um, and obviously we're doing the work to make it easier. So, you know, choose your poison. Yeah. Uh, do I need the riser plate to use the laser with the vortex? Um, oh, riser plate. Yeah, yeah, you will still need that. It's the same situation. Although so. I think maybe if we have more mounting points, like we have two sets of mounting points. It's hypothetically a bit fast, a bit higher, but mm -hmm. I guess. Not that high? Yeah, I, I don't know if I could say with full right. confidence. Um, you said this is going to be rigid enough for some harder materials like mild steel. What max, th max thickness do you think is reasonable? Uh, I'm trying to recall what the cut I was doing was, but I think it was like, we'll say like 10 millimeters deep of a cut. Uh, and I was like stepping over, I don't know, maybe like near one millimeter or something. Uh, it was like pretty significant. That being said, like, yeah, you're probably good to use whatever thickness you want. It's more about kind of what tool you're going to be using. Um, you can't be cutting one inch steel with like a tiny eighth inch end mill. You'll need to use a beefier end mill. Um, but yeah, pretty much sky's the limit as far as what you can do with that. Um, but yeah, if you're just slotting out like profiles and contours, like probably stick to something around like an eighth of an inch or a quarter inch. Yeah. Uh, could the next, could the next batch be earlier than July or more likely later? Um, typically when we make our estimates, we do add like a month or two of buffer. Uh, I think the July is still pretty tight and also it depends on how much or how many orders we get and depends on where you are in line. So we will probably start shipping in July, but it might not mean you'll receive the machine in July. Um, We'll post more information as we go from there. Uh, I ordered from the first 50 batch and I have final cost. Will there be any more charges shipping already in the final? No. So assuming, uh, unless you're not in the US, so if you're shipping outside the US, um, you might have duties and taxes, but what you paid is what you paid. Um, there are extra stuff that you might want to buy that like tooling and mills, vortex, laser beam, so on and so forth. Uh, and obviously you can make the choice if you need them. Uh, but yeah, like we don't need to charge you any more money for the alt mill itself. Uh, I don't know if you guys covered possibility 
of an ATC in the future. Yeah, we kind of touched on this before. Uh, it's like something that's very much possible, but we haven't really, we don't have any uh, immediate plans for this. Um, yeah, like we were talking about before, we sized the drag chains on this machine to accommodate things like water-cooled spindles with water lines and maybe some plumbing for pneumatic style tool changer. So, yeah, cool. Uh, what's the life expectancy of the linear rails? So um, we've done some re research on this part of it. So the lifespan of the linear guides is like really, really long. Under normal use, I think like minimum three years. But the biggest factor that determines the lifespan of the linear guides is on the maintenance side the lubrication because the thing that kills and, and we get a lot of experience from the lifespan of the linear guides because we use some we use some of them for the uh, long mill if you don't lubricate them they'll die like it's kind of like a the thing that's a, a different one of the things i point out which is different on the blog between the long mill and the alt mill is the fact that if you don't do the maintenance properly some of these things can be catastrophic and you'll have to replace the parts if you kind of mess something up on the long mill, mm -hmm. you can replace them and it's like not that big of a deal. Uh, but yeah, in terms of the maintenance cycle, uh, if you lubricate the linear guides and the ball screws every three months, uh, and we'll have a guide on what, sort of, uh, what to do and we'll have a kit on lubrication, uh, a kit to do the lubrication available. But I would say at least every three months, if you do the lubrication properly, they'll pretty much last like forever. It's like, uh, it won't die of nat like, I guess the best way to put it, it won't die of natural causes. It will mm. be like, you'll break something accidentally sort of deal or you won't do the maintenance sort of thing. I think practically speaking, it was something like 30,000 hours. Mm. I have to look at the documentation again to see the actual details, yeah. but yeah, the lifespan of the linear guides themselves are really long. It's also like a super variable thing to say, like it's something we couldn't really give you an exact number for without knowing how you might use the machine. So we don't want to kind of over promise something if it's like seriously neglected. Um, yeah. Yeah. We will have like all the parts available on our store to replace and they won't be, we usually sell them pretty close to cost. So we'll make it really easy for people to replace parts if they need to. Mm. Um, so, yeah. Will you provide, oh, oh yes, right. Will the spindle and VFD be available separately? Uh, I guess we just talked about that, yeah, at some point soon-ish. Unless they're talking about spindle as one thing oh, and the VFD as another thing. I see, logically we will have both as a kind of a replacement part style. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like not, because most people buy both at the same time and like it's just a lot of time and cost for us to do the resources to help support one being used for the other, it might not make sense in terms of the volume scale. Uh, so I want to anticipate it. I think it, yeah, I want to anticipate that being an option uh, if that's what you're talking about. If you're talking about the VFD oh, and spindle. Both together. Oh yeah, then Kay. yeah, probably. We'll take your money, but. <laughs> Stop saying. <laughs> yeah, we'll take your money. <laughs> Uh, can we have a range of port connections for the dust shoe? I'm using a dust collector with six inch connections. I think the version we have is four inches. Yeah, we're going for four inches right now. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a adapter likely for uh, smaller hoses and stuff. I think Unless it's, you go six inches. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, it can literally be any size, but we can't accommodate everyone to some extent. So they do have adapters that's like not too hard to find uh, adapting, you know, six inch to four inch and the like. So it might have to be one of those routes, but yeah. Will you provide a machine specification file for HSM advisor FS wizard? Mm. Um, yeah, this is very, it's related actually, uh, Johan was showing me this morning, they have uh, the print and C, CNC machine is in uh, Millilizer. Oh, that was Millilizer. Yeah. Anyways, yeah. Uh, we, I don't we think might. we've ever made the HSM. We haven't, no. We probably, sh yeah, well, maybe we should do that, yeah. We'll yeah. look into it. But cool. I don't think it's like a big, big priority because um, I think we're mostly cutting woods. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
uh, is it possible to cut four by eight sheet goods in two passes moving in between, AKA tiling? Uh, yeah, so it is mostly a function of software. Mm. Um, but yeah, the back of it, the machine is open so you can basically push the, 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 yeah. the whole sheet back all the way to the back and cut you know, in, one, in one piece. Uh, as, uh, oh, sorry, I'll go. Yeah. <laughs> as the alt mill seems to have the ability, rigid enough, will you offer a spindle kit with an ER20 collet to hold larger end mills? Uh, yeah, so we were originally going to go with an ER20 size, but it's much less common for this sort of spindle. Um, so it's going to be an ER16. Uh, yeah, I guess you're looking to hold like a half inch tool. Um, the reality, I guess, is that, yeah, when you're like a 1.5 or a 2.2 kilowatt spindle, I don't know how often you'll be needing to use half inch tooling. Um, like, you know, three eighths inch or eight mil tool is like, sorry, 10 mil tool is like pretty large as is. So yeah, I think that's kind of back into the same realm of like, if you're going to half inch tooling, you may as well go buy yourself a six kilowatt spindle and do three quarter inch tooling. Um, yeah. Uh, if I purchase the spindle kit, will it come with the required wiring to run it with G Sender as well as the VFD come programmed? Yes, that is the plan, exactly. So it should all be just a plug and play kit. Cool. Oh, I'll just keep going. What size end mills will the spindle take? So uh, as per our product page, it comes with the eighth inch, quarter inch, and three eighths inch bit. Um, the maximum size is three eighths inch. So or you could hold like a 10 mil tool if you'd like, which yeah. is technically larger, but. But since we're using the ER16 system, you, if you buy ER16 collets, you can use anything within that range. Yeah, yeah. they're super cheap, so. Cool. Cool. Anything else, guys? No? Everyone's falling asleep? How many people do we have on the stream? 133? Okay. Oh, I thought you were saying one. <laughs> I was like, oh shit, we're just talking to <laughs> Chris Tallman this whole time. Yeah. Anyways. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, thank you everyone for being part of our stream, being part of this launch. We're really excited to get these alt mills out the door. Mm -hmm. We'll be continuing to work and sharing things on our website and uh, as we do. Any final words and thoughts? Not really, no. I mean, excited to see what people make with this. Like, I think I've said in other videos, it's like, this is super exciting to try and use for the first time. It's like blown all of us away. Everyone that's gotten the chance to use it so far has been like amazed. Uh, so yeah, I'm just like really excited to see how everybody uses the machine, what their initial reactions are. Uh, yeah, it's pretty mind boggling when you actually start pushing it to its limits. It's scary and rewarding, but yeah, make sure you're safe while you use it. Cool, alrighty. I guess we'll wrap things up. All right, bye-bye guys.